We're giving the Civil War in 3D. We'll go ahead, Dave. I'll, I'll actually talk about that because we're going to do um, uh, the uh, uh, show and tell thing uh, first uh, to be able to do that. Uh, Eric, okay, are, we, are we recording this? Start the show and tell. Yes, we are recording this. Yes. Great. Okay, great. And I'm passing it over, I guess, to Valerie first. One thing I should say, everybody should have their anaglyph glasses on, preferably red cyan. Uh, also, if, you're, if you have anything for show and tell, add it into the chat, and we'll hit that oh. after Bob Zeller's uh, presentation. Awesome. Well, well done. I think uh, there's not much I can add to that. Thank you, Steve. Um, except to introduce uh, David Peterson, who's going to give us a, uh, a short one-minute presentation to kind of kick off the evening, and then we'll go into our um, other events. But uh, David, would you like to take the floor? Absolutely. And, and Val, just for you, uh, your audio is just very, very low. I can oh. barely hear you. Okay. Okay. So, uh, because of our uh, presentation tonight, uh, Civil War in 3D, uh, that uh, Steve actually had asked me a, a couple of months ago if I would do uh, a presentation in July uh, regarding this, and uh, so I actually invited Bob, uh, and that uh, on my shelf uh, in my office here, I actually have five books uh, that I always keep on hand, and three of those are regarding uh, Civil War stereos, and so I wanted to be able to share the Civil War stereo ones that I have here. Uh, so uh, this is one of my prize collection ones here uh, that, uh, let me see if I can get this to point where we can see it a little bit better there. Actually, let me do this. Let me turn yeah. off yeah. my screen share. Yeah. That's gonna turn be off the screen share. Yeah. 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 Turn off your green screen. Uh, actually, I don't have a green screen. I have a black screen. Oh, all right, turn off your black screen. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is, uh, my uh, this is the first uh, Civil War uh, stereo book that uh, that I bought before I met Bob, uh, and uh, that uh, actually it is um, if I can get over to the page on here, uh, it was kindly autographed by Bob on there for me. Uh, basically, what this is is, and it's going to be part of what he's talking about tonight, is that he has uh, actually taken uh, these are actually stereo cards uh, from here uh, that actually go through and talk about. Uh, the history of uh, stereo during the Civil War. Uh, it has uh, uh, numerous examples in here. There's actually a little viewer in the back for that. Uh, and this was actually a gift that I got at Christmas in 2009. I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, the next year, I got this book, which was the follow-up. So this is volume two. I really, really like volume two over volume one, principally because this one actually has a section on colorized uh, uh, stereos uh, from the Civil War. A and there's a whole series of them. I, and of course, I didn't have it marked to the page. But there's a whole series of them in here uh, where uh, they actually go and uh, show uh, the images in color uh, for these uh, uh, that were hand colored during the war. Uh, so these are actually um, uh, stereo. Uh, let me just bring up a page here. There we go. So these are actually uh, stereo ones in here. Uh, that are really, really just fantastic. Uh, and this is actually sort of the idea that I had when I started producing my own Civil War stereos in there. So it was something that I had a real big interest in. And then I have uh, one final uh, Civil War stereo book uh, that I have, which is, of course, another one by Bob Ziller. Uh, this is Lincoln in 3D. This one is actually an anaglyph book. So the previous two were ones that were actually uh, where they had reprinted the stereo card. Uh, this one is an anaglyph, and it has uh, just uh, countless examples in here of, uh, of stereos from the Civil War uh, where uh, they're going through, and, and they have it in uh, stereo in there. And then there's anaglyphs in the back of that. Of course, we're going to go and take a look at that this evening and go into more detail on that. Uh, so those are uh, the ones that I have in here. Uh, just going through, and I'm sorry, it's I'm I'm trying to hold this by hand, so it's a little bit difficult uh, to be able to do. Uh, but it's just a fantastic book. Uh, give you a background on the war, give you a background on uh, Civil War uh, images in there, and so uh, those are what I wanted to be able to show in my show and tell. Uh, just a little bit of uh, what inspires me. I literally keep those right next to my desk. It's something that I have on hand uh, all the time uh, when uh, when I'm going in there. So just wanted to share that. A compliment. 
So with that, uh, now I'm actually going to go over and actually make the introduction for Bob here. Uh, so Bob, as I mentioned, there are five books, and I've showed three of them there. Uh, and there are two other books that I have uh, that I do keep on hand. One of those, but they're not about stereo. They're about Civil War photography. One of those being another Bob Zeller book, which is uh, the uh, blue and gray and black and white, also auto kindly autographed by Bob. And then, Bob, there is one last book that I have that is on my shelf, and it's not by you. I hope that uh, you don't mind that I have one of a, a book that, that I use as a reference or as a guide that is not one of yours. But if I was going to add one more to the collection, do you know which one I would add? Oh, one of Frasinito's books, maybe? Uh, yep. <laughs> Uh, so uh, this journey is, yeah, yeah, this is uh, uh, the uh, Civil uh, Gettysburg, A Journey in Time, uh, actually autographed by William Fresnito. Uh, for those that don't know, William Fresnito is, uh, if, uh, if uh, Bob is the, uh, the father of, of Civil War photography and, and uh, has uh, shown us all how to be able to uh, understand and to be able to learn from that, uh, then uh, I, I would uh, say William uh, Fresnito is, is more of the grandfather. He's actually been doing this uh, since the 60s. Uh, he was actually a guide at Gettysburg. Uh, and, uh, that he, What really interested me in, in what William Fresnito did was that he actually went out to the locations, found where the actual photographs were. In fact, that's actually what got me really interested in this. So I want to do a little introduction here for Bob. When... I started doing the colorizations for uh, Civil War stereos, which I'm going to talk about after this. When I started doing those, uh, that um, I told my wife, I said, we've got to go to, uh, to the East Coast, got to go to some of the battlefields. I hadn't been there since I was a kid, and we planned a trip. So I'm planning a trip, and I'm looking for things in Gettysburg, and I see that the Center for Civil War Photography has an Image of War seminar coming up uh, that fall. And they were actually going to go to the battlefields, go to the sites, and go to the places where the actual images were taken, and they would take you onto those sites. Perfect. Exactly what I wanted to see. Uh, and so I signed up for it immediately. I got the information from uh, the group. Uh, and then a couple of weeks later, I get the uh, flyers about uh, the, uh, the seminar and announced who the speakers were. And what I, I was, to my surprise, I was thrilled that the principal speaker there was Bob Zeller. I didn't realize at that time, Bob is the president of the organization and he's always their principal speaker. I did not realize that. I did not realize that his connection, I had actually registered for the seminar without realizing it, even though I already had a couple of the Bob's books. I get to the seminar and I'm hoping, hoping, hoping that I get a chance to be able to uh, talk to Bob uh, and to be able to have a few minutes with him uh, so uh, that um, uh, I uh, was uh, on the first day we we're going out and we're going to the battlefields and we're going to different locations. Uh, they'd taken us around on a bus and they give us a box lunch and I'm, I'm standing there with my box lunch. I'm trying to find a place to be able to sit down and Bob waves to me and he goes, hey, uh, you know, do you want to come and join us? And he was sitting with somebody else that, that I didn't recognize. So I went over and I sat down and Bob had me join him at his table. Uh, the other gentleman who was there uh, is actually the co-author for uh, for uh, Lincoln in 3D, which was uh, uh, John Richter, who's the director of, uh, of photography for uh, the Center for Civil War Photography. Uh, and uh, so I spent my lunch talking Civil War photographs with these two guys and principally talking about serials. If you ever have the chance, one of the things I would definitely recommend is attending one of their seminars. I'm not sure what they have coming up for this year because of COVID or uh, what their plans are for the future. But basically what they do is they take you to the location and take you out to there. They have a great deal of interest in stereo photography. And when you're on the site, they will literally take you to the spot where the photographer stood. And then they will put up large 20 by 30 inch prints of uh, an anaglyph of uh, the image uh, that was taken during the Civil War from the direction that you would be looking if you were the photographer. And so you can literally stand there and you can see what it looks like today. And you can see it from the anaglyph what it looked like in 3D. It's just an amazing uh, immersive experience uh, to be able to do that. It's just one of we my call favorite. call it 4D. <laughs> it's, it's, it's fantastic, Bob. It's, it's one of those things I can't uh, say enough just how thrilling it is uh, to be able to do that. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to be able to do that a couple of times. Uh, I've seen Bob give the presentation that he's giving tonight uh, in person. Fantastic presentation. He gave us a little preview of that, and uh, it's really whet my appetite to be able to hear that again. So I'm really looking forward to that. 
Uh, I do have a, a, a question for Bob, though. Um, where did you actually start with uh, Civil War stereos? What brought your interest into uh, Civil War uh, photography and Civil War stereos uh, specifically? Because I know that you do have uh, a specific interest in uh, the stereo part that we're talking about tonight. Well, I, um, I first antique as a kid was uh, an antique stereo viewer. I bought it at an antique show when I was about 14 years old, but it was uh, like 15 years. I was 28 years old before I saw my first Civil War stereo view and my jaw hit the floor. It's like, where have these been all my life? I had my little collection of late 19th century views and uh, curved mount views, some some stuff, but I didn't had no idea it went back as far as the Civil War. And as soon as I found that out, I began to discover that uh, you know Alexander Gardner took 1,200 stereoscopic views of the Civil War, um, and most of the negatives, as we as we've discovered over the years, have survived, and they're large plate negatives. And at, at you know at some point in time, that was 1980 when I got my first stereo view. And it, sometime in the early 1990s, I was like, somebody's got to do a book on this. I mean, you know, the photography is the thing that really ties us to the war uh, in, in the most intimate fashion. And nobody's ever done it in 3D. And that's the way it was taken and meant to be seen. And so that it was really a hobby for many years. And it's ended up kind of being my career. Um, and, we, and you can come visit us, our website, civilwarphotography.org. Um, and and um, in our journal, which we publish three times a year, we have it, always have at least one anaglyph or more um, for 3D viewing, because that's the way the photographs were taken back then. They, Absolutely. They were taken that way, they were the video of Civil War America, as we'll talk about as I get into the show. So Bob, can you share, uh, you shared with us when we were doing a little bit of the rehearsal uh, that uh, uh, well, this was the first stereo view I ever owned. Um, it's an Alexander Gardner view of Bloody Lane at Antietam. Antietam was my specialty. Um, my my father comes from that area, and in forty years of collecting, I've I've managed to get <laughs> nearly every one. And this is one of the very first examples of a numbered card collectible card set, um, the forerunner of baseball cards and, and other collectible cards. So uh, um, I still you know, collect them, but most of the work we do now is off the original negatives. And in the show tonight, you'll see black and white shots. Those are generally off the original negatives that still exist. And the sepia tone, the brown tone photos are generally albumin prints off original, off original prints. Yeah, and after uh, Bob is done, I'm going to uh, talk about how to do colorization uh, for those of you that are interested. And I'm going to go and uh, sh uh, share uh, some links where you can actually find those yourself. Uh, here is, uh, I don't know if you can see this very well. Uh, this is one of the ones uh, from, the, uh, uh, from uh, the Center for Civil War Photography. Uh, for uh, Stephanie just handed me that uh, for uh, the... Uh, uh, the type of uh, presentation they hand out. So there's uh, great images and great stories in there. Uh, Bob uh, usually writes an article in there for that, and it's just a terrific uh, resource for that. Uh, so I want to turn it over to Bob to go ahead and get us started here uh, this evening. Uh, this is a about a 40-minute presentation. Uh, it is going to be in anaglyph. So uh, if you haven't already uh, got your uh, anaglyph glasses, uh, be sure to be able to have those ready because you're definitely going to need them uh, and you're going to want to see this. This is uh, I've seen it in person uh, previously and like I said we had a, a five minute preview uh, this evening. Uh, I'm, I'm dying to see this Bob uh, and uh, that uh, I'm looking forward to getting this going. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and open up my screen and just let me know when you're ready to get ourselves started here. We're actually I'm doing ready. a little bit of an interesting thing. Uh, Bob's doing the presenting and I'm doing the uh, screen share. So uh, that's basically the way that uh, that we're operating here uh, for this evening. Actually, let me make sure that I shared that appropriately. Let me do this one more time. I want to make sure. I should yeah, say I there's about time. four or five, uh, mostly right in the beginning, uh, non-3D illustrations. Everything else is 3D. Now the show tonight continues a grand condition, uh, tradition of theater style projected shows of Civil War photographs that go all the way back to 1864. They actually had 
Civil War slideshows of actual photographs on the 600 square foot screen in New York City, advertised in the New York Times. Now this woodcut shows a presentation from about 1890. Um, I think it needs to, to, you need to start the show though. Um, okay, I, I was gonna say, just let me know when you're ready for me to hit the Yeah, I'm ready. All right, Wait, and there we go. Um, I, just want to make, I, I just want to jump in to make one suggestion. Um, at the top of the screen under view options, there's a choice to choose fit to window and that will make the image go full or screen. Just in case um, people have it up at original size, you can actually have it fit to the window size. Thanks, Val. Welcome. All right, I'm gonna hit the uh, play button, Bob, and we should be going. So this illustration is from an 1890 catalog of Civil War photographs that included many stereo views. Um, it shows a stereopic and so they couldn't show them in 3D back then. Um, but nonetheless, you could always show them as just regular photographs. Mic off. Hopefully everybody's still hearing me. I heard some something say mic off, but okay. In 1861, the United States was looking down the proverbial barrel of a gun. Years of tension between the North and South had only grown worse, and the country felt itself slowly slipping into an ever-widening chasm, an abyss that would embroil the nation in its greatest conflict. Now here you see an example of a, of a Civil War photograph off the original glass plate negatives. The long simmering dispute was over slavery and whether states should have the right to dictate whether or not it was legal. This view was taken in about 1866 on St. Helena Island in South Carolina along with this one. The Southern economy was based on slave labor and the massive production of cotton, tobacco, rice, and other agricultural products. In the manufacturing heavy North, the abolition movement had been growing since the 1830s. The surprising nomination of Abraham Lincoln as the Republican president can presidential candidate, followed by his election in 1860, helped escalate the dispute into a crisis. Southern states vowed to secede from the Union. As this was going on, the U.S. was being gripped by stereomania. Everybody was crazy about these new 3D view cards that presented magical depth-filled scenes through eyepieces of 3D viewers, like those seen at the Anthony headquarters in New York. The advent of the glass plate negative in the late 1850s allowed for the unlimited printing of paper photographs, both stereo views and card photos. This tinted French view shows the stereo card production around 1860. The stereo view card was the video of Civil War America. And here we see a, stere a stereo view store on Broadway in New York around 1860. I like to call it the blockbuster video of Civil War America. The stereo craze was big in the South too. And in Charleston, photographers Osborne and Durback went out into the field in 1861 and took the most dramatic and historic Confederate stereo views of the Civil War, developing glass plate negatives in that little square tent behind the gun. The artillery militia in Charleston resplendent in their manner, their dress, their top hats, bring their piece out, their brass cannon out to practice and to talk and jaw among themselves what the future might hold in turbulent times. This photo dates from about February, 1860. On December 20th, 1860, South Carolina seceded from the Union and other Southern states soon followed, forming the Confederate States of America. The South prepared for all out war and photographer Os photographers Osborne and Durbeck on King Street in Charleston captured this remarkable 3D view of the Lafayette artillery of Charleston practicing on Coles Island, just outside the port city around February 1861, or just a couple of months before the war. The Illinois lawyer headed to Washington to take the oath as the 16th president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, 
was photographed by Matthew Brady in Brady's studio almost as soon as he arrived in late February 1861. When Lincoln was inaugurated in front of an unfinished Capitol dome on March 4, 1861, seven states were in full revolt, having seceded from the United States. Lincoln implored in his address, though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. But six days after South Carolina seceded, Union Major Robert Anderson, shown here in this beautiful uh, restored studio portrait, occupied Fort Sumter with his small garrison of less than 100 men. This outraged the South. The Confederate commander, General P.G.T. Beauregard, shown here in civilian attire, demanded that Anderson leave. Week after week, month after month, the standoff continued. But at 4.30 a.m. on April 12, 1861, the Civil War began with the Confederate bombardment of Fort Sumter. 34 hours later, Anderson surrendered the battered fort. In this remarkable sequence, we see that Osborne and Derbeck, the Confederate photographers, were the first then and now photographers Here's Fort Moultrie on Sullivan's Island in August 1860 with the American flag being raised above the fort. You can see the lawn is well kept, the shrubbery is My gone. and on either side of the walkway. And as we zoom into Charleston Harbor, we see Fort Sumter before the war with sunlight gleaming off the chimney studded barracks roofs. Then after the bombardment from exactly the same camera location, we can see that the barracks roofs and chimneys are gone. And as we pull back, we can see Fort Moultrie now dressed for war. The shrubs are all but destroyed and the flagpole has been sandbagged. This cannon at Fort Moultrie shelled Fort Sumter coming up here. I like to keep it on the shot just a great 1860 view of Fort Moultrie. Now this cannon at Fort Moultrie shelled Fort Sumter during the bombardment and the Confederates on the parapet there on the left were among the war's first veterans. This image also was taken by Charleston photographers Osborne and Durbeck just days after Fort Sumter's surrender on April 14, 1861. The Confederate flag flies high on a makeshift pad flagpole, so it is readily visible across the harbor in Charleston. The original flagpole, you can see it on the left, it was hit by shell fire and it took the flag off, the American flag. Inside Fort Sumter, these remarkable 3D photos after the bombardment, really the first stereoscopic images of the Civil War and establish the interesting fact that Confederate photographers were the first to document the war with their cameras. South Carolina governor um, on, the, on the parapet, excuse me, on the parapet at Fort Sumter, Confederate ordnance officers examine a Union gun disabled by a misfire. The attack galvanized the North and in New York City, a great Union meeting was held on April 20th, 1861. Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteers to put down the insurrection. First blood was shed in Baltimore as secessionist rioters attacked Massachusetts volunteers on their way to Washington to protect the Capitol. Cumberland, Maryland residents gather at a, the bookstore in the town to hear the news from Baltimore that at least four soldiers and nine rioters had been killed in what is today known as the Pratt Street Riot. Washington had little protection at first and soldiers assigned to protect the White House built huts on the grounds of the president's home, which you can just barely three, see through the trees there in the background. A company of Union troops stands at attention on the south lawn of the Lincoln White House early in the war. the Lincoln White House as at the time that Lincoln occupied it. You're looking at the back of a huge recruiting banner spanning Broadway in New York City around May 1861, urging Scotchmen for the Union to join the 79th Regiment. This particular view is owned by Jeff Krause, a well-known stereo dealer, and very generously let me use it. From the original glass plate negative in Alexandria, 
We have the Marshall House, where proprietor James Jackson flew a massive rebel flag high above his hotel, visible from the White House. Lincoln's personal friend, Colonel Elmer Ellsworth, led his troops into Alexandria. Ellsworth was shot dead by Jackson as he descended the steps with the flag. Jackson, in turn, was shot dead by a Union trooper. Ellsworth became a Union martyr. His body lay in state at the White House, and his blood-stained uniform was put on display at Union fundraising fairs during the war. Washington soon filled with soldiers, and Brady photographed some of the men of the elite blue-blooded 7th New York militia as they posed in camp with a young African-American servant. Photographers also went up to Camp Essex at a railroad junction just outside Baltimore. And these soldiers at Camp Essex may have been with the 8th Massachusetts, one of the first regiments to answer the call. These men were 90-day recruits, and they probably finished their service without firing a shot in combat. Not a lot happened at first, and the carefree attitude of the new recruits are, is evident in some of the camp images taken that spring of 1861, including this image of a pyramid of 7th New York soldiers. And near Annapolis, soldiers play for the camera in the only Civil War beach bathing scene I've ever encountered. This is probably showing the Chesapeake Bay there in the background. Few portraits in the field exude the sense of innocence and resolve as this memorable Matthew Brady image of fourth Michigan private Richard Kramer, the original negative at the National Archives. Men like Kramer marched, marched out to Manassas that July 1861 and there engaged the Confederates in the first Battle of Bull Run, which became an overwhelming rebel victory. In the vortex of the battle was the Henry House, occupied by Mrs. Judith Henry, who lost her life as her house was destroyed in the fighting. Now this photo was taken in March 1862 after the Union troops uh, finally regained possession of the Bull Run battlefield. On Henry House Hill, Confederates were buried next to a pond of standing water that today, 150 years later, still collects like that in the same spot, right next to the visitor center, just 100 feet. In Centerville, just east of Bull Run, the Stone Church served as a sanctuary for wounded soldiers after the battle, not only of First Bull Run, but of Second Bull Run. This and what if you were a kid living near Manassas when a war arrived at your farm? Perhaps you would face off with Yankee cavalry as these Confederate youngsters did at Sudley Ford in March, 1862. And this photograph by George Bernard and James Gibson. This is wartime Washington, DC. And you look out of your hotel room at the Metropol in the Metropolitan Hotel onto Pennsylvania Avenue down towards the Capitol building with an American flag flying over the broad avenue. During the Peninsula Campaign in the spring of 1862, James Gibson took one of the first great American war photographs showing wounded Union soldiers at a makeshift field hospital at Savage Station, Virginia. A regimental surgeon works on a wounded soldier there in the foreground. And during the campaign, we had the Battle of the Monitor versus to Virginia, and you stand on the deck of the USS Monitor, proudly showing its battle scars from its fight with the CSS Virginia at Hampton Roads in 1862. The war was going badly for Lincoln in 1862, and this photo taken that year seems to reflect the somber, worried mood he was in while facing one setback after another. After another big Confederate victory at Second Bull Run, Confederate Commander Robert E. Lee, shown in this post-war 3D studio photo from by Brady, took his army into the north, invading Maryland in early September 1862. The commander of the Union Army of the Potomac, General George B. McClellan, shown here with his wife, put his massive army into motion and went after the Confederates in Maryland. Lee, meanwhile, divided his army into three port parts and sent Stonewall Jackson to capture Harper's Ferry. Jackson's men swept these Union defenders off the heights above the city. The two armies gathered and faced off outside Sharpsburg, Maryland, 
along the banks of Antietam Creek, which was spanned by this graceful three arched stone bridge known as the Middle Bridge. Nearly identical bridges were both just a short distance north and, and a short distance south, with the southern one, of course, being Burnside Bridge. The Battle of Antietam became the bloodiest single day in American history, with more than 22,000 dead, wounded, or missing, including these Confederate artillerymen who fell near the battle-damaged Dunker Church. A sunken farm road became known as Bloody Lane after Confederates used it as a defensive position and fell in scores trying to defend it. This photograph was taken on September 19th, two days after the battle, the photographer's first opportunity to get onto the field. The gruesome scene of dead Confederates along Hagerstown Pike also shows another element, the presence of a civilian buggy and spectators. In mid-October 1862, these images caused a sensation when they were exhibited at Matthew Brady's New York Gallery. The New York Times reported the living that throng Broadway care little, perhaps, for the dead of Antietam, but if Brady has not brought bodies and laid them in our dooryards and along our streets, he has done something very like it. Newspapers could not reproduce photos yet, so the graphic images from Antietam uh, were reproduced as woodcut engravings. The real photograph, as we transition to, presented a more graphic reality. Alexander Gardner took these photos. He was Matthew Brady's Washington gallery manager and one of his best friends and one, someone he traveled with quite frequently during the war was Alfred R. Wode, the sketch artist for Harper's Weekly, who may have converted, probably did convert the Antietam photos into the drawings that were fashioned into woodcut engravings and published in Harper's Weekly, which was uh, kind of like the life magazine of its day. Here from the original stereoscopic glass plate negative is Alexander Gardner's photo of Confederate dead line for burial in Antietam. And then we segue into the Harper's Weekly engraving of the same scene published October 18, 1862. An Antietam landmark, then and now, is Burnside Bridge on Antietam Creek which we see from the original glass plate stereo negative. This uh, bridge got its name from the general who had so much trouble getting his Union soldiers across it during the battle. Working on Brady's behalf, Gardner took 20 images of the dead at Antietam, every single one of them in 3D. Wrote Oliver Wendell Holmes, a stereo nut, a, a real enthusiast and leading person, let him who wishes to know what war is look at these series of illustrations. Two and a half weeks after the battle, President Lincoln visited the battlefield to confer with McClellan and prod his slow moving general into action. The glass plate negative still exists for this image and the clarity is just remarkable as we zoom in on the scene. Alexander Gardner also took this stereo photo of Lincoln towering above McClellan and the other Union generals. Lincoln was photographed at least 130 times, but mostly in the studio. So these outdoor images in the field are really special. The negative no longer exists on this picture. It's off one of the few prints uh, that, that still exist. Lincoln soon replaced McClellan with General Ambrose Burnside, who led the Union Army to its next disaster at, in Fredericksburg on Marie's Heights, on which stood the Marie House, which was damaged during the battle. The city of Fredericksburg was shelled during the conflict as well, and many homes, including this one, suffered expensive damage. Back in Washington, the city had become a wartime capital and you needed passes to get in and out. Here, soldiers checked passes at the ferry landing on what is now Roosevelt Island across from Georgetown. Of course, there were lighter moments too, as when Private George Bear of the 1st Wisconsin Heavy Artillery 
crawled down the barrel of this massive 15-inch Rodman gun at Battery Rogers in Alexandria to pose for a stereo photo taken by Captain A.J. Russell, the only official Army photographer of the war. This is the view Lincoln saw from the south portico of the White House, looking south toward the stub of the partially completed Mon Washington Monument. This is a post-war view, but it basically shows the same scene that Lincoln would have seen. Now, Alexander Gardner parted ways with Brady and in 1863 opened his own Washington gallery at 7th and D Streets, festooned with advertising. Gardner would continue taking war photographs throughout the conflict and eventually assembled a collection of more than 1,200 stereo war views. In June 1863, Lee invaded the North once more, leading to the biggest battle of the war, three days of furious fighting in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Here we see the Leicester Farmhouse on Cemetery Hill, where Union General George Meade made his headquarters. Those horses were killed during the artillery shelling that preceded Pickett's charge, which would have occurred off to the left-hand side of this image. More than 50,000 men fell in three days of fighting, including this Confederate who breathed his last among the rocks near Devil's Den. Gardner, joined by his photographers Timothy O'Sullivan and James Gibson, was first on the battlefield. The team took this shot of dead Confederates at the Rose Farm. Gardner repeated his grim feat at Antietam, and the images of Gettysburg and the dead battlefield dead are just as graphic and final. Matthew Brady also came to Gettysburg, but he arrived about two weeks after the battle, after the bodies had been buried. But his images, such as this one of Little Round Top, have their own style and personality. This is just a spectacular 3D view. Brady captured scenes that Gardner missed, such as this image of the Lutheran Theological Seminary where Union Cavalry General John Buford watched from the cupola as the Confederates advanced towards Gettysburg on the first day of the battle. Brady photographed 69-year-old citizen hero John Burns, former town constable, who grabbed that flintlock musket and went out to fight with the Union boys on the first day of the battle. He was wounded slightly three times. Now Brady's most famous image from Gettysburg arguably is this one. Three rebel prisoners dressed in their classic uniforms paused to be photographed on Seminary Ridge before being moved to a prison camp. An intriguing question, and one that I've pondered really since childhood, is are there any actual action photographs from the war? Now this Antietam image by Gardner has been misidentified for more than 150 years as showing actual battle action. And wouldn't it be cool if this actually did show battle action? But these are actually Union troops gathered around campfires. The troops that were held in reserve, if McClellan had used these troops, the Union Army might have won the Battle of Antietam instead of it being a draw. However, on September 8, 1863, Confederate photographer George Cook was summoned to Fort Sumter by the Confederacy to document the damage rendered by the ongoing Union bombardment. While there, a huge naval battle broke out in Charleston Harbor. Crook, Cook crawled to the parapet with his stereo camera and he captured this amazing image of enemy Union gunboats in action with battle smoke pouring off the massive USS Ironsides in the lead there on the right. Cook was the first photographer to capture, capture the enemy in action while himself under fire. The first documented combat photographer was a Confederate photographer. Union photographer T.C. Roach may have captured an action image in December 1864 while photographed the photographing the digging out of, the canal, of a canal at Dutch Gap, Virginia, to cut off a loop in the James River. Moments after taking that first photo, Roach took another stereo plate. The original caption on the back of this view says, the mist arising against the bank is caused by a rebel shell which exploded just as this view was being photographed. This is how Lincoln appeared in January 1864 in a Brady studio photograph less than two months after traveling to Gettysburg to dedicate the National Cemetery with his iconic Gettysburg address. 
are three photographs in stereo by Alexander Gardner of the Gettysburg Address crowd. And because they're the original negatives, we've been able to study these, and it's actually triggered uh, kind of a pretty big controversy. Basically, the question is, where is Lincoln? We know he's in this photograph. Um, and I'll get to the questions after the presentation here. So as we zoom in on this first photo, you'll notice that there's a lot of uh, open ground in front of Gardner, and he's on a camera platform. I have to think that he was disappointed with being so far away. I also have to think that Gardner went to Gettysburg with the intent of capturing a photograph of Lincoln. Why else would he have gone there? Now here we see as we zoom in in this series of details, zooming in as far as we can in the, the original glass plate, you can see the Evergreen Cemetery Gatehouse there on the left. This is the same image and we continue to zoom in. We see an eagle on a standard of floating there kind of above the crowd. You can see the all the Union soldiers, you can see emulsion damage beginning to appear, the little cracks in the photos. But you can also see very clearly one fellow with a top hat sitting above the crowd. Now, when Lincoln entered the, the, the uh, ceremony, he rode through a corridor of soldiers. And this photo to me is shows Lincoln turning back to the soldiers and raising his left arm, not in salute, but but to acknowledge the soldiers. We know that Lincoln wore white riding gloves on the day that he went. And I think that the white riding glove blurred because of the um, multi-second exposure. But I think that shows the white riding glove. And that's one of the key things that I believe identifies Lincoln as this person. Now within 60 seconds of taking the, the, the last plate, Lincoln took another, or uh, Gardner took another plate now, if anybody working as fast as they could possibly do to take two photographs, you figure there's something in the photograph that he's trying to capture. And once again, as we zoom in on the scene, we see who I think is Abraham Lincoln sitting on his horse, facing the troops that he had just rode through, went wearing his black top hat. You can see he has a black outfit on and all the soldiers around him have blue uniforms. They don't appear blue, but they don't, they don't show as dark black like, like this guy's um, uh, outfit. And as we zoom in further, to me, this particular image, once again, taken while Lincoln was in, in the same exact position, shows his beard and, and really goes a long way towards showing exactly who we're talking about here. I think this is Abraham Lincoln. I think Gardner was disappointed that he was so far away. We've never found any stereo view prints of this particular image or the last one. And, but these are off the original glass plate negatives which survived. And we take it as far as we can in this one. Now, just a few years ago, a professor uh, down here at, um, uh, in Asheville, uh, Christopher Oakley decided that he found Lincoln elsewhere in the picture. And actually we've got about maybe three Lincolns, so-called Lincolns identified. I don't buy it, but I'm gonna give him his, his, his share here because it, this is what the controversy is about. You know, who is Lincoln, where is he? And if you see that little kind of uh, banner uh, hanging there, uh, Christopher Oakley's Lincoln is just below that. Now there's no question that, that the photographer is not trying to capture Lincoln in this picture. He just happened to catch this guy. It's hard to see, but, but you'll see Lincoln's head. And maybe when we darken it, you can see it better. His top hat is, is pointed kind of uh, at an angle and his head is facing a little bit down. And, um, Christopher says that this is Lincoln and uh, none other than William Frasinito and also Harold Holzer uh, believe that this is, is more likely Lincoln than the other. I, I absolutely disagree, but you can make your own decision. We've shown you <laughs> both Lincolns. Uh, I, I don't think we need to go and try to find the other, other Lincolns that have been identified, but I think my story 
uh, is the best. Um, clearly, I think this is Abraham Lincoln sitting once again in the same position as he was uh, in the other photograph and giving Gardner this one opportunity to capture an image that was so far away, Gardner didn't choose to market the image. He took a third photograph in stereo of the scene. This is probably during Edwin, Edward Everett's two hour speech. Um, the, there's not enough um, detail visible on the speaker stand to really make out who anyone is. In March 1864, President Lincoln appointed Ulysses S. Grant commander of all the Union armies. And Grant, by May, was in Virginia in pursuit of Robert E. Lee. Now, Grant raged, waged a relentless campaign that included the battles of the wilderness, Spotsylvania Courthouse, Cold Harbor, and eventually the siege of Petersburg. At Massaponax Church in Virginia on the last day of the Battle of Spotsylvania, Grant and his generals pulled the church pews out of the yard and met with met together for what has been characterized as a council of war. Church still stands today. It's got incredible large graffiti by soldiers on its walls on the inside. And the pews that are seen in this photo are still now back inside of the church. The wounded and dead piled up on both sides and in Fredericksburg, convalescing Union soldiers were photographed at Marie's Heights after the Battle of Spotsylvania. Now we have documented 100 and different, 104 different photos of battlefield dead taken on eight different occasions in the war, but this shot at Fredericksburg of Union dead about to be buried is the only one with a camera, and a stereo camera at that, visible in the background. At Cold Harbor, Matthew Brady put himself in the picture, as he often did, did it more than 30 times. He sits with General Ambrose Burnside in a close examination of the original glass plate negative when Darkened reveals that Burnside is reading a copy of the Daily Intelligencer, a Washington newspaper. About 185,000 African-American soldiers served in the Union Army during the war. More than 38,000 lost their lives. But for many black male slaves fleeing the South, joining the Army was the best opportunity immediately at hand. At Harewood Hospital in Washington in early 1865, the long, narrow wards made for great 3D photographs. Lincoln and his wife probably visited this hospital since it was close to their summer residence uh, at Soldier's Home. And this is the Harewood Hospital mess hall, heated by elaborate new wooden stoves. The hospital started as a tent hospital, and it was located on the farm of W.W. Corcoran, Corcoran Art Gallery later. Anyway, uh, this farm was on 7th Street Road, once again, very close to Soldier's Home, where Lincoln had his, um, the house he lived in most of the time in Washington. In the fall of 1864, General William Tecumseh Sherman marched on Atlanta, captured the city, and occupied it for a couple of months before starting his march to the sea. Photographer George Barnard took a remarkable series of stereo views of the city before it was burned by Sherman as he left town. Nearly all of the original negatives for Bert, uh, Barnard's uh, Atlanta photographs survive. You're looking down Whitehall Street in Atlanta just days before Sherman burned the city. Train cars are loaded for the last train out of Atlanta. But down in the center of the image, there is a little knot of soldiers gathered around some sort of an instrument. We discovered, as we zoom in on it, we discovered just a few years ago that this is actually a four-person commercial stereoscopic viewer. Soldiers paid a penny or so to look at these, look into the eyepieces at 3D photos. I doubt they were photos of the war, but who knows? Before departing Atlanta, Sherman's men tore up the downtown railroad tracks and destroyed the commercial district of the city. 
Barnard's photographs show the, the, the downtown train station, both intact and here now as it was left in ruins after it was dynamited to be destroyed. When Abraham Lincoln was inaugurated for his second term in March 1865, the war was almost over. Lincoln's speech, with malice toward none, with charity for all, was only 701 words long, and the photographer had to move quickly to capture this stereo view while the president spoke. We zoom in on this view. It sold on eBay in early 2000s for about $3,000. It's now owned by the Nelson Atkins Museum. Oh, the only 3D view of Lincoln's second inauguration while he was speaking. Another 21st century discovery is the fact that this image, said to have shown Grant's inauguration, actually shows Lincoln's second inaugural crowd. The crowd is well lined up and orderly, except down in the lower right of the photos, where several young men who have obviously visited a Washington bar are making things rather loud and not pleasing the people around them. The beginning of the end came in early 1865 when Grant launched an all-out assault on Lee's Petersburg's lines, breaking the siege of the city. This is where the last group of dead were taken, photographs of battlefield dead, and the trenches around Petersburg took on the appearance of trenches from World War I. Richmond fell on April 3rd, 1865, and the Confederates burned the city as they fled. Here, two women dressed in black two are the ruins of the capital of the Confederacy, the former capital. And with the towering ruins of the Gallego Mill behind them, a group of recently freed African Americans posed for Alexander Gardner's stereo camera in April 1865 in one of the more dramatic photos of the war. And this is drama for, in 3D anyway. All that remained of Fort Sumter after years of bombardment was rubble and twisted metal coming right out of the screen, almost as if you could touch it. Now inside the same battered Fort Sumter, which had remained in Confederate hands almost throughout the entire war, a ceremony was held to re-raise the American flag over Fort Sumter. The date of this ceremony was April 14th, 1865. It was a particularly good day for Abraham Lincoln, although looking far older than he had just four years earlier, Lincoln took a long carriage ride around Washington with his wife and made plans to attend the theater that night. The play he went to was Our American Cousin. It starred Laura Keene. And this stereo photo was kind of a, a promotional photo for the play, which had opened in her theater in New York in October 1858. This publicity photo was taken just seven weeks after the opening. Our American Cousin was one of the most popular plays of the Civil War era, and by the time it got to Ford's Theater in 1865, Miss Keene had given more than 1,000 presentations of it. Lincoln had actually seen John Wilkes Booth act on stage at Ford's in 1863, but on this night, Booth slipped into their box and fired a single shot from a Derringer into Lincoln's head. In the aftermath of the assassination, every Washington building, including the U.S. Treasury, was draped in black and flags flew at half staff. From high atop a building on Pennsylvania Avenue, photographer Alexander Gardner took two stereo views of the solemn funeral parade as it made its way down Pennsylvania Avenue towards the U.S. Capitol. And here's the second view that Gardner took from the original glass plate negative. These negatives are four by five inches. That's a lot of detail. They, they've got just as much detail as you would expect from a four by five inch negative. A New York photographer 
Jeremiah Gurney took a remarkable image of Lincoln in his casket lying in state at New York City Hall. News of this image horrified Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, who confiscated all negatives and prints. The image was lost for almost 100 years, but Stanton kept a single half stereo print, which was rediscovered at the Lincoln Library in Springfield in 1952 by Ronald Riefeldt, a 15-year-old budding Lincoln scholar. And that picture was the only one that we recreated in 3D because we know it was taken in 3D. Now, photographers and Gardner particularly were taking news events as they happened, including this three photo sequence of the hanging of the conspirators. And this middle one, the drop, shows the four conspirators swinging at the end of the ropes uh, moments after the, the trap was dropped. One photo, the third one, the suspension, the glass plate negative still survives and we can see the four conspirators hanging dead um, after this July 1865 event. For two days in May 1865, the Union Army held a grand review parade down Pennsylvania Avenue. Sherman's troops marched by foot all the way from North Carolina to join in. There are many photographs of this parade from this vantage point, but it is not the parade photograph that engages me but an image of the crowd. As we can almost literally walk back in time, we peer into the eyes of our great, great grandparents, the people who actually lived during this historic time. And so the muskets were lined up as they were here in Petersburg. And what to the people who watched the Grand Review was present day life slipped into the realm of history, enhanced by a remarkable catalog of stereoscopic photographs. And that's it. Yeah. I think there was, there was one question, um, and was it the exposure times? Um, yeah, how long is it typical? They, they could range, uh, it, depending on the light, anywhere from, say, two to three seconds. Uh, today, Rob Gibson, the uh, wet plate photographer, is generally seven or eight seconds. It could be longer. One of the most fascinating aspects of early photography at that time was the instantaneous photograph. And you saw a couple of them in the show. Uh, one of them was the recruiting banner hanging over New York City. You know, the, the, if you might have noticed that the um, that the omnibuses, the taxis, were frozen in action, um, and and Anthony uh, took great pride in these instantaneous photographs, advertising them as being taken at a fortieth of a second. Why they didn't take them in the field, uh, Alex uh, Rob Gibson suggests that maybe the collodion was was too volatile. But uh, they generally were, did not use the instantaneous technology in the field. Um, Do you have any idea what the ASA of a wet plate was? Oh, Dan, I, I do not. I do not. I'm, I'm not a technical guy, so I, I couldn't. I couldn't answer that. Uh, sure the ASA on there would have been really low. I remember uh, a conversation about the ASA for that. And I believe it was something like uh, 10. It was just enormously low, uh, which is contributing uh, not only to the length of the shot, uh, but also to the quality of the image uh, because uh, that uh, the uh, silver nitrate that was being used on there uh, was very, very fine grained. Uh, and that uh, that's why that Bob was able to zoom in so far on these images uh, compared to uh, modern images where they start to uh, get that blur. You just don't have those on those uh, original stereo plates uh, for this. So these were daguerreotypes. No, no they were wet plate, um, wet plate negatives, um, and oh, oh, I think those are called tin types. No. No, the tin types and daguerreotypes and amber types are all sort of like one of a kind. Um, think Polaroid image. Um, can, the glass plate negative revolutionized photography at the beginning of the Civil War because it allowed for the first time for the mass production of prints. 
you could make limitless prints off of a single uh, glass plate negative, and that's Start that's why the else. Civil War was photographed because the photographers could uh, create uh, hundreds and hundreds of stereo views or carte de visites and 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 sell them and make a profit. You could you could identify the photographers because their hands were black from the silver nitrate. Yeah, there's a great studio portrait of Gardner, um, and if you look at his uh, hands, the, the fingernails are, are jet black. And we all, we we just in the past few years, we've discovered several photos showing Gardner in the field, uh, and the one the way we're able to identify one of them, not, it's not a 3D photo, or I would have shown it, um, is is because of his black fingernails. It's kind of a side view, so you can't really identify him from his face, but if you look at the hands, and there it is, all the all the silver nitrate on his hands and fingernails. If it's wet plate, you have to coat the plate and you have to shoot the picture within a certain amount of time before it dries, I think. Yeah, Rob Gibson says he he, he figures that they had to run the, the negative back to the, to the uh, you had to develop it on the spot while it was still wet. And he, he thinks that they, they tended to dry so quickly that the, the assistants or the photographers would, would literally run from the camera back to the back of the wagon where they would develop the plate immediately. Now it wouldn't make prints there, they just store the plate and then they make prints on the roof of the Gardner's Gallery when they got back to Washington. And of course the, they were orthochromatic also. Uh, I assume a sensitive what to is, what, I'm not only sure what that is. But it was sensitive only to blue light. Yeah, there um you mean I think that's why they're the clouds don't show up that much um, in the photos. Um, some technology later, George I'm, Barnard in, in creating his uh, 11 by 14 inch albumin prints of Sherman's expedition, double printed uh, puffy cumulus clouds into the tops of many of the photos. And sometimes you see the same pattern of clouds over Nashville that would be over Atlanta. <laughs> But, but it was an interesting thing. I mean, they're really spectacular photos because you do see clouds in those photos, but it's double printed. The, there are a handful of them that I'm, actually have uh, there are. clouds in them. And there are. they're just amazing. Uh, I think a couple from Richmond and a couple from Savannah that I can recall. Uh, yeah, and that, the, uh, sketchbook photo, Gardner's sketchbook from, um, I believe it's Harper's Ferry, you can see clouds. Um, and then there's a few daguerreotypes too where, you, where there's actually clouds are visible, but not very often. I mean, you, were, you were talking about the, uh, the I'm, photographer's I'm... Uh, studio. There's actually uh, quite a number of images of uh, the photographer's uh, trailer or cart uh, in a number of the photographs because they were so close uh, to the images. It's actually kind of kind of interesting uh, spotting those in, in quite a few of those images. Yeah, we did a whole issue um, or a whole big feature on um, the various wagons and whose wagons there were, and not all wagons. Uh, at, at Gettysburg, Brady used a, a portable developing outfit on a tripod, um, which is in one photo. Um, and you saw that Osborne and Derbeck also had a separate hut or um, a little box, or, you know, that that they did. Um, but many of them were at the back of the wagon, and the wagon sometimes is identified because you can see a tarp hanging down from the back, and that's what the photographer would tie around his legs to shut the light out. Uh, you were uh, talking about the photographer's did, did assistance. Did Gardner... Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Eric, go ahead. Oh, I, I, I was just wondering, um, with so many of these post-battle images, did Gardner ever repose the things that he found on the battlefield um, to make for better compositions, or did he shoot it as was? Well, Gardner sometimes would add props uh, to some of the photos of the dead, um, a musket or, or other items. Um, there is the one famous incident where he photographed a, a body of a Confederate soldier and then dragged it 73 yards to the uh, sharpshooter's nest at Gettysburg. Um, it, mostly what he did after the war was go west. But George Barnard, in doing his Sherman campaign book, went back and visited the spots that he had photographed during the war and took new photos. And 
the book that he did, Sherman's Campaign, with I think 66 photos, most of them are post-war, but some of them were actually wartime photos as well. You know, I was thinking about what Eric said, and it's actually was tying into what I was going to mention initially, uh, that, that Eric was asking, did they ever restage some of these things? There's a number of images from uh, uh, Richmond and Petersburg uh, where the, the photographer's assistant actually played the role of a dead body uh, in uh, some of those images uh, to be able to... Uh, uh, you know, I mean, you see the same guy uh, standing next to the thing, and then you see him dead, and then you see him in a different pose. Uh, so uh, there's uh, there's one guy in particular. I don't know. Do we know who that guy is, Bob? Uh, I don't think it's identified which assistant. There's one at Gettysburg too, and they actually they captured oh, really? because he's a wounded soldier. <laughs> <laughs> but he's posed. It was a Brady photo, and like I said, there were no. Uh, no bodies left to be photographed by the time Brady got there, um, even though he took amazing pictures. Uh, and, but he, he tried to fake it at least once. So, I mean, one of the things that Bob was talking about, about having moved that uh, one uh, image uh, up the hill, uh, that uh, is, is probably one of the more famous images of a dead soldier uh, at, uh, at Devil's Den there. I should have put it in the show. It's 3D. Yeah, yeah. I've actually, I've actually got it. I, I don't use it as one of my backdrops uh, because uh, I don't care to uh, have the images of the uh, of the dead uh, as part of my backdrop. So I don't like to do that. But I do have it. Uh, the reason that I was mentioning that though is that when we went there, that's actually one of the things that was like so incredible was to go there with the Center for Civil War Photography, go out to that site, uh, and we actually traveled from where. Uh, the body originally was and then uh, traveled along uh, the uh, places where they'd actually taken the photograph until where it ended up in the final photograph there. Bob, are you still with us? So your audio is for, your video is frozen here. Ooh, uh, we did didn't we lose him? Bob. Might have. So I, I can know he talk said he sometimes has computer issues. Bro. Yeah, hopefully that uh, we'll get him back there in a moment. But uh, that uh, I mean, uh, looking at, for example, the one that I have in the backdrop uh, here, uh, this is probably one of the more famous uh, images of uh, Confederate soldiers. Uh, this is one of those ones that he was showing in there in stereo. It's one that was done by Matthew Brady. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm showing it just in 2D, uh, just uh, because the, the colors show up better uh, than if you had to do it with an anaglyph. So that's why I have it as the 2D for that one. The reason I'm mentioning this or this particular one though is this image was actually taken about 100 yards from where I actually first met Bob. Uh, so the image was taken at the top of Seminary Ridge. Uh, he had shown a, a spot where it okay, was Okay, I'm below. back on my uh, Oh, we got back you. on my daughter's computer. <laughs> I, like I had warned everybody beforehand, uh, my computer just blue screened on me. So uh, <laughs> Can well, they hear I, you? I don't know. Hey, at least, okay, we, at least you can wait on. until you finish Hang the presentation. I'm going to do some settings. Yeah, we David can hear you Richardson, great, Bob. I, David Richardson, I suggest you segue uh -huh. into your presentation because we can always return to the we, open end. Got, yeah, we, yeah. We've got Bob back. Uh, so uh, that uh, I mean, I would like to be able to make sure people have a chance to uh, be able to uh, answer, ask questions if they have more questions before we move on. Bob, I'm I'm so grateful that this did not happen during the middle of the presentation. If it was going to happen, at least it waited. <laughs> I'm also grateful that my daughter decided to uh, to join the show because my it, it'll take about when it blue screens like that. It'll take about five minutes to come back up. Wow, wow. So anyway, I'm, well, I'm, at least it was yeah. polite enough to wait until after you finished. Oh my gosh. I have a quick comment. Yeah. I remember yeah. uh, your presentation in Richmond where uh, you were followed by the, the couple from uh, the Smithsonian showing their program flat and expressing apologies for their embarrassment because it was obvious that they were just, they had draped one of the, either the, you know, the right image and only showing half of a stereo pair from their collection at the Smithsonian. <laughs> at the NSA well, convention in Richmond. I, it's been the, you know, I, I guess Bill Frasinito, as David talked about him at the beginning, is, is the dean of our field. But I've always been thankful to him because he never touched the 3D aspect. And to me, the stereoscopic aspect of Civil War photography is just so compelling, especially when you have 
hundreds and hundreds of original stereoscopic glass plate negatives that survive that you can download for free from the Library of Congress and use Stereo Photo Maker to make anaglyphs. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, none of the books I grew up with showed stereo photos um, as stereo photos are even made any reference. It was just like Three Rebel Prisoners was just like a regular photograph. And I'll sit there and like, you know, watch Ken Burns' series today and just go, that was stereo, that was stereo. And yeah. he never mentioned it, yeah. never mentioned it. So um, it's, it's been an just tremendously exciting to, um, to be able to say, oh boy, look at this aspect of Civil War graphic history that's never been touched. And, 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 and even after doing, you know, several books, the kinds of things that we still find today, I mean, that's the thing that really keeps me excited about the field is that we're still just making all these, every few months, something new comes up. Um, just all the time. And most recently, we have these four, these large play photographs with four sequential photographs from, of the same thing four frame motion pictures. You can actually see movement. They're not 3D, but um, that's what I've been working on here most recently is, is Civil War motion pictures. <laughs> you can actually see ships moving. You know, the, the sense of motion is, is really remarkable. And if you want me back, I'll show you that. I, I got the, my best, my kind of primary show now is called The Grand Review, and it's a review of all the discoveries we've made uh, the second half is in 3D, um, but the first half is in 2D because there's a lot of uh, non-3D photos that are really interesting and discoveries that we've made with them, including the motion pictures. Well, yes, Bob, I think we would love to have you back again uh, yeah. for a future meeting. Um, Definitely. I'd be happy to do it. These you got a lot more images in you. I don't have to drive anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that was that was really, really uh, fantastic presentation and, and to see the yeah, Bob, the depth uh, in these pictures and to see them with, with such clarity. I'm so I'm sorry that the, the some of the zooms were not real smooth. I'm not I'm not sure uh, whether that's built into the show that I made. Um, because I have the same problem on my computer or whether it's just not running fast enough, but you know, it, small thing. It, it may have been uh, because I was looking at the live uh, one on my system uh, and the, the uh, zooms and the transitions were smooth here. So it may have been uh, something related to zoom. I did have it optimized for video, uh, yeah, well, but uh, you know, we may have a, a little delay on that. I had it running on, on two computers here and they all looked pretty smooth to me. Yeah, there is. It may be on the user. Maybe it was just my computer. It probably was just my. I saw them. They kind of. Yeah, yeah. It, it looked smooth, it looked really good on my end. Are, yeah, are you talking great, about your computer, the blue screen, Bob? Yeah, the blue screen computer. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Like it may be time for a new computer. <laughs> it was giving you some signals. <laughs> hey, Bob, you mentioned that uh, Bill Frazzanito didn't touch on the stereo aspect. I own the uh, Gettysburg Journey in Time book as well as one he did on Antietam. And if I'm not crazy, uh, he might have included one stereo view in one of those two books. Do you remember? And it was my first sort of inkling that, oh, wow, here's a researcher that's gone back and taken then and now photos. And I kind of did the same thing on my own a few years later in stereo. And I just, I seem to recall one, maybe in the Antietam yeah. book. It was the Antietam book and it was a, 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 fa a soldier, a fake, uh, a, a stereo photo of, of fake dead. Um, ah. He was proving that the same soldiers that were photographed standing were, were photographed uh, in stereo as yes. a dead. <laughs> um, right. and, and the Antietam book came out in 1977, and I should have noticed that. <laughs> and, and Journey in Time and Antietam refer to the stereo photos. They don't show them in stereo. Oh, right. in the printed matter, they say they're you know, stereoscopic. And that, that went over my head. Um, it hit me until October 1980 when um, I was at uh, this uh, guy who wrote a gardener book, Mark Katz. I was in his living room in Gettysburg and he showed me an ant the, the Antietam stereo view I, I showed. And I was just, where have these been all my life? 
I mean, how come I don't know about this? You know, I, it was just, and and somehow the it didn't trigger. The, I had Frasinito's antique book almost immediately, but it, it didn't it didn't register. <laughs> but it finally did come together. And that finally book by Mark Katz is amazing, called Witness to an Era, I believe. That was amazing. The Life and Times of Alexander Gardner. It's got a number of excellent reproductions of stereo views in it. Yeah, it's um, well, it, I'm, it, I'm it, sure it that... an amazing collection of images. So some of the some of the uh, text, some of the factual stuff is not actually factual, but uh, oh. the, the the images <laughs> images are amazing. <laughs> well, I'm sure I'm sure that everyone here who doesn't have your books would love to get them. Uh, what's the best way to get your books? Amazon. <laughs> None of the three okay. books are okay. still in print that I know of, but I just had a, somebody call me about Lincoln in 3D, which is probably the best one in terms of, because, you know, we got full page anaglyphs and, um, and you can get that online at Amazon for like 11 bucks. So, um, um, and if it happens to not come with a viewer, well, you guys, you're a three, you, you have glasses already, but uh, <laughs> I provide glasses because <laughs> we pass them out at, at the shows that we do all the time. But um, um, yeah, that, all three of the 3D books um, are no longer in print that I know of. But Amazon's a good place to get them. They're all fantastic. I appreciate you putting them out. Hey, Bob. I very much, I'm photobobbing uh, David. I can't get my camera to work. Very much enjoyed <laughs> the presentation. I have a ton of questions, but I'm going to just leave it with Confederate photographers, Fort Sumter. They had the photography equipment, chemicals. Did they have a career after the war? Were they able to shoot anything during the war? Or was their career sort of ended when they could no longer get stuff, photography materials during the war after it started and the embargo and all that? Well, um, George Cook, um, I've done a lot of work on George Cook and, and Dave, the book David has uh, blue and gray and black and white, a history of civil war photography. Uh, he, he invested in blockade runners. And so he was able to get chemicals uh, and supplies during the war. And his account books, which I've more or less audited, which still exist, um, uh, show that he sold supplies to at least eight or 10 other Southern photographers as late as 1863. Uh, so photography didn't completely die. If you remember, the, uh, A.J. A. J. Riddle, a Georgia photographer, Confederate photographer, took the amazing photographs of Andersonville Prison uh, in 1864. Uh, and George Cook was taking his stereo views inside Fort Sumter in 1863. There are very few examples, but there was a little bit of photography going on. Um, and yeah, pretty much right after, after the war ended, um, I mean, one of the persons who moved to Charleston and became a photographer there was George Barnard. Um, so um, they, the, the pictures of the slavery pictures I showed uh, are actual, you know, not slavery, they're after slavery, but an amazing series of photographs from St. Helena Island and the Penn School that was established during the Civil War that still exists today outside of uh, Beaufort, South Carolina. Um, so yeah, the, after the war, um, there was started up again. And of course, at Gettysburg, you know, stereo photography at Gettysburg uh, and my Gettysburg in 3D show is, is basically as much, a lot about the Gardner and Brady photos, but then photos taken during the stereoscopic era, you know, through the early 1900s. And I've got then, 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 and nows and four different eras of like the sharpshooter's nest. And um, right. so there was a lot of photography after the war. Photography, one of the various myths of Civil War photography was, oh, well, you know, they didn't, so many sketchbooks Gardner because everybody was tired of the war and it was over it's a bunch of bunk the Anthony war for the Indian stereo series which might be the biggest series of stereo views during the entire era more than 1,100 views didn't even get published until the spring of 1865 it went through two printings they didn't even lower the price on the views for about four years um, Finally, the, the panic of 1871, it was 1871 or 73, I'm not sure, 
kind of kind of uh, killed the business. But uh, the stereo views of the war sold quite well for three or four years after the war. You can follow the catalogs, the anthem catalogs, and finally in 1869, the price starts to drop. And Gardner's sketchbook, they only made 200. It was one of the most expensive books ever made, $150 a copy. It was by subscription only. It was by design that they only made 200 copies. And nearly every one of them sold, as best as we can tell. And the glass plates didn't end up as greenhouse glass, as you'll see in, in one or two books, um, maybe of common citizens, but um, most of the original uh, documentary photographs of the Civil War, the core collections, Alexander Gardner, the Anthony War for the Union series, those 1,100 stereo, most of the negatives still exist for all of those. At the Library of Congress, download them for high, at high res for free right now, anytime you want. So they're really accessible to, to anyone. Now, one thing you have to do is restore the plates to a certain extent, especially in stereo, because well, and that, that's, that, actually, that actually leads us right into what uh, David has been doing with uh, Civil War stereo images. David, do you want to talk about your restoration work? Uh, do we want to do that now, or uh, is there other uh, questions or comments that we have for Bob? I want to make sure that uh, because uh, that uh, you know we've got Bob here as a special guest, that we take the opportunity to take advantage of that uh, before we jump into uh, anything else. So, um, anybody else have uh, questions or comments for Bob while we've got him here? I'd like to initiate another round of applause. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Bob, let me ask you a question in regards to the uh, Center for Civil War Photography. Uh, I know that when you and I had uh, talked a couple of weeks ago uh, that you had mentioned that you were still planning on doing uh, a uh, Image of War seminar uh, this year. Is that still going on or has COVID uh, impacted that? Uh, what, are, what are your plans there for that? <laughs> At the moment, it's still scheduled. Um, I'm getting pretty nervous about it because I just canceled the 2021 Rose Parade. Yeah, I saw that. Scheduled for October 1st through the 4th in Gettysburg. We're going to be outside most of the time, so um, I don't know. My wife just told me today we ought to can we ought to cancel it. So, but at the moment, it's still on, and you can sign up for it. To see more about it at civilwarphotography.org. Um, and we do, as David said, visit the sites where the photos were taken. And in a number of cases, we have poster-sized anaglyphs, and we set them up right where the photographer was. And you get to have our 4D experience, which is a 3D photo, but being on the spot where it was taken at the same time. Um, so uh, I'm kind of figuring the way things are going now that we're probably going to have to push it to 2021, but um, we'll see. Well, uh, I am not planning on uh, going this year because of the way things are that uh, by the, I would actually have to arrive two weeks ahead of time so that I could quarantine myself uh, <laughs> coming up from California. I'm not <laughs> I'm personally not going to get on an airplane until I get a vaccine. So, uh, yeah. So uh, that I mean, I would love to be able to go back and to do those uh, for uh, for that. Um, that uh, I know that you haven't had the opportunity to be able to do any other presentations and things, uh, but I really am thrilled that you had the opportunity to be able to do a presentation for us tonight. Uh, and as Eric had mentioned and others had mentioned, uh, I mean, we'd love to be able to have you back again uh, sometime to be able to talk about. Uh, some of your other presentations uh, that uh, the, uh, the I've, I've seen uh, quite a few of your other presentations, including this one, and it's uh, always a thrill to be able to see them and to be able to uh, just uh, spend some time uh, just reimmersing myself in the uh, Civil War stereo. So, uh, thank you very thank much. Thank you, and I'd be happy to do it. It's very easy. I've got the shows already prepared, and um... and as long as your your computer doesn't blue screen, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I did shut it down and restart. It was a little late getting, yeah, yeah. not late, but but close close to the ten o'clock uh, or seven o'clock uh, deadline. But yeah, that worked great for having me, and and I, I obviously love the subject, so I'm happy to present it to fellow 3D enthusiasts. 
so uh, I, I don't want to keep we, you we have longer. A, we have a question. Yeah, in, go, yeah, go ahead, Eric. We have a question in the chat. Uh, somebody just wanted to know if, if any of Bob's presentations are recorded and available anywhere else. I think that a program that I did on George Cook is available on C-SPAN, um, but I don't have any of my shows online. Um, so I guess the answer is no, with the exception of, um, of, of, of one that I did on C-SPAN at the, at the time, um, well, it was like 2005. So it was um, when blue, gray, and black and white came out. <clears throat> Yeah, I actually have that on VCR. On VCR? Wow. Yeah. Uh, so, Bob, do you have any uh, future uh, Civil War, either uh, stereo or uh, just uh, Civil War uh, imagery, photograph uh, books uh, planned uh, here? Um, nothing, nothing planned at the moment. Um, um, you know, publishing has become so um strange you know you can self-publish and stuff like that i've got some books i want to do but 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 nothing at the works at the moment how many of you a lot you of the about cutting edge a lot of the, the most of the cutting edge work that i'm doing in civil war photography is published in our journal battlefield photographer um like this upcoming issue uh, we've got a new, a new fo previously unknown photograph of Confederate dead on an unknown battlefield um, that just was uh, came up at auction a few months ago, um, and we have a, at least one anaglyph in every issue, um, and this one will have several, including the rarest of the Antietam dead photos. Um, uh, we happen to have found two different Brady album gallery full frame prints, and they happen to be from the diff from the left negative and the right negative. So we've put it together in beautiful 3D for the first time, um, and um, that'll be published in in August. Um, so that's where that's where most of my uh, new stuff is is uh, showing up. We publish up three times a year, and it's. It two or three historical articles in every issue. It's, it's, it's not just a newsletter, it's, it's really a historical journal. And if anybody would like more information, uh, you can visit the Center for Civil War Photography website. Uh, and I've, I've put the link in the chat. Uh, you can click on it there or you can go to civilwarphotography.org. Thank you. Fantastic group, uh, absolutely 100% uh, recommend it. Uh, I've been a member of uh, them for years uh, for that. Um, uh, Bob, have you considered uh, doing any of the on-demand publishing so that you can uh, bring your books back uh, so that they're not uh, no longer out of print uh, for some of those? Well, the, the, the one that, um, if you look up blue and gray and black and white online, it costs like $130. And it's I like know, a, I have it. <laughs> it's like a $20 book. They The, the publisher makes that available on demand, but it's really a crappy copy compared to the original first printing, which is library bound with the uh, paper covers. And this is just, I mean, I got six of them and I sent them back. They were so, I tell people if you try to, if you want to get that book, which is my history of civil war photography mm -hmm. online and make sure the advertisement talks about a, a paper cover because the the uh, the on-demand reprint is so awful and it's just i mean the original copy was 75 bucks was was you know really overpriced and and i don't know how they got what got into their heads to, to raise it to like 130 dollars but well you know if you ever try to get that book get it online and try to find a used copy because it's so disappointing it's you know it's like these reprints of Miller's photographic history. It's on cheaper paper. Uh, it's, it's just really not a quality product. <clears throat> the, the one that I have is uh, the one, oops, I stopped my video instead of, uh, let me restart that. 
I need to turn that off. There we go. Uh, the one that I have is uh, the one with the uh, paper cover. Uh, so right. I have uh, the good quality one in there. Uh, fantastic book uh, for that. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I'd love to be able to see uh, your other books uh, available in, uh, you know, in an on-demand format uh, in some, well, some way that you controlled so that you could actually uh, be able to uh, participate in the uh, revenue from those, uh, but to be able to have something to be able to help uh, fill that library for uh, for those of us that uh, are looking for those books. So. Yeah, well, I, it's um, I I haven't done it yet, so. Uh. Bob, I'm curious when you were. Um, deciding to put out the Civil War in Depth Volume 1. Um, I remember books started showing up on the market about that same time that had the viewer built into the cover. And I was curious, did you go through a decision process of what format to do it in? The one that you ended up with, or maybe with a viewer built into the cover and the images all printed sideways? I was very lucky to find Chronicle Books as my publisher. They're this wonderful San Francisco um, publisher with uh, really skillful graphic design. They had published a book previously called California in Depth. Mm -hmm. And um, you all probably are familiar with it. And the reproductions of the stereo views were smaller, but they used the same sort of stereo viewer that they put in the Civil War in Depth, which was this little folding thing. It didn't really have convergent lenses, so you couldn't run the photos very big. With Civil War in depth, we, I, I pushed the limits. <laughs> really, I really would like to have these views published at near actual size, and they, they are close to it, but they push the limits of that viewer to the max. Now, the second book, second volume, Civil War in depth volume two, they actually put um, a very high quality lorgnette viewer separately packaged in a piece of cardboard that was a shrink wrap attached to the book itself. Um, so they probably often get separated. Um, but then we, we published the, the views at full size um, and, and that was a better quality. But I mean, if you're gonna start with one, I would start with Lincoln in 3D because it's it's got so many photos and Many of them are at full page. We've got a two-page spread of one of Gardner's tricks was panoramas. They love panoramas. And in Richmond, at the end of the war, they'd take five plates, five stereoscopic negatives showing an entire panorama. And uh, we just using two of them, we fill up a two-page spread in that book. So that's probably the, the one to go to. Also, we've got we reassembled Lincoln. We've got a dozen portraits of Lincoln in there. You know, he was shot in the studio and generally in the studio for mass marketing purposes, they'd use a seven by nine inch large plate with four lenses. Hmm. And they weren't trying to make stereo, but the two lenses on the top and the bottom were stereoscopic. <clears throat> and we literally reassembled stereo. We found one carte de visite. We would find a carte de visite, say at the Library of Congress. And then we found one on eBay and 500 bucks for it because it was a matching stereo pair and we were able to reconstruct the stereo, uh, a stereo view out of the two images from the separate lenses of the studio portrait of Lincoln. Did that in a number of cases. Um, and, and I thought that was a, a pretty, pretty cool thing that we were able to do. Um, we've been looking for John Wilkes Booth <laughs> there. We still been looking for it. Uh, you know, from, from the left and right lenses, uh, either top or bottom. Um, we've got a booth picture in the book, but uh, there's a better portrait of him that we, we're still searching for. This is the viewer that uh, Bob was talking about uh, from his first book uh, in there, and it's an odd little thing. It folds up, uh, and then uh, you use that uh, for that. Um, it's okay. Uh, I actually uh, personally will use either a lorgnette or use an alveolar to be able to view. Yeah, that. I never, never use. <laughs> I always use a lorgnette, and I yeah. know the anaglyph glasses in Lincoln in three D. That, that that was a case where they over designed it, and the temples don't really fit very well. Um, I've, I've, I've used I've, a pair of our Center for Civil War Photography anaglyph glasses. Yeah, <laughs> I, I actually uh, use uh, you know my own uh, set of. Uh, 
of anaglyph ones. I've never taken and I've never actually opened the uh, uh, the sleeve where it has uh, that in the uh, Lincoln in 3D uh, one in there. You know, it's like uh, I'm going to leave that uh, pristine for <laughs> for whoever buys that after I'm uh, after I'm uh, gone and buried. Uh, if they want to break it out, otherwise uh, that uh, it's there, I'm keeping that one. Bob, I noticed your name on another book as well here, the Santinum in 3D, um, that you wrote with uh, Gary Edelman and uh, John Richter. Uh, yes, sir. Curious, did you do any other anaglyph books as well? Yes, sir. Um, the Center, that's, that's a publication by the Center. It's a soft cover book. Once again, my specialty starting out was Antietam because I, I'm actually a, a raised in the Dunker Church, the Church of the Brethren, and my dad grew up in Hagerstown. And that's when it started. It was an interest in Antietam, the fact that the photographs were taken there. So some of my original stereo views are reproduced in Antietam in 3D. We've also done Gettysburg in 3D. Yep. And they're all anaglyphs, and the glasses come with the book. You can get them all as well. <laughs> you can buy them at the Center for Civil War Photography shop on online. Um, but both of those, those are the two more 3D productions that, um, that we've done at the Center. They're fantastic. And I just want to thank you for all your detective work over the years, because it's been really uh, fun to see, your, uh, see the fruits of your labors. It's been really fun to do it. I mean, like I said, you know, it's... Just uh, within the last two months, oh my gosh, another photo of Confederate dead. Nobody's ever seen it before. Wow. <laughs> and I'm, I'm happy, I'm thrilled that we're going to have it exclusively on the cover of our journal in August uh, in just a few weeks. So uh, <laughs> um, anyway, thanks for having me. And if you, if you, if you want to do it again, we can, uh, we can do one of the shows. I think I'm going to, I'm going to back out here and head off. Oh. Dead, so yeah, it's, it's thank you, to thank you so thank much you for, so much, for spending your thank you yeah yeah this was really great um uh, I, i'm sure everyone here really appreciates you spending the the time late on a thursday night to be here with us thank you well i'll be happy to do it again if you want thank you. thanks thanks bob thanks thank a lot you. thank you thank you Yay. thank you see y'all later Bye bye. Bye. All right. Thank uh, you. That was awesome. Well, thanks. Thank you. Uh, do we want to take a break or do we want to uh, just uh, plug away with uh, the we other? We do uh, the show and tell, and then if people want to take well, a break. Uh, David, David, Dave, David's going to do his presentation, and then we're. David's going to do his presentation, and then we'll end with the show and tell because that can run as long as it needs to. Well, I just thought, okay, do you need a break, David? No, I don't. I'm good. Okay. We had just talked about doing a break in there sometime, but I'm fine. Yeah. No, no problems at all. Uh, so, yeah, I'm actually going to just spend uh, just about five minutes or so here. Uh, that When you look at the images that uh, I've got on the screen here behind me uh, that are in color, uh, one of the things that a lot of people uh, ask about is that how did I do those? How did I get them in color? Uh, where did those come from, uh, et cetera, in there? And uh, so uh, I wanted to be able to spend uh, just a few minutes uh, talking about that and uh, that uh, how uh, to be able to do those. Uh, so uh, let me let me do this. Uh, there we go. Uh, so I actually have uh, quite a number of images uh, of various uh, Civil War ones uh, that I've done uh, over the years. I've done more than 600 of these. Most of them I've done in stereo. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend a few minutes just talking about how to do the colorization. And then I'm going to actually show you where you could actually go to be able to get those from, directly from the Library of Congress and how to be able to find a couple of those. I'm going to give you a few tips on being able to do that. Uh, and then we'll turn it over to be able to do uh, the, uh, the presentations uh, for uh, any other show and tells that people have. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and uh, let me share my screen on here. And I will show this one. This should be good. And let me bring this up to full screen. 
So uh, what I did was I put together uh, just a, a little quick guide on how to be able to colorize uh, stereo images. So I'm going to go through that and to be able to talk about uh, those on here uh, for a moment. I'd be happy to answer any questions on there uh, for that. So what we're going to do first is we're going to look at one of those images. This is an image uh, that was done with one of those uh, multi-plate cameras that Bob was talking about. This was actually done with a nine-plate uh, camera uh, or a nine-lens camera on there. Uh, and these are done from uh, two of those. Uh, I forget which row it was on, but it was two of those uh, on that particular camera. And you see the damage. This is actually one of the better uh, versions of this. I actually did both sides in this. I'm actually showing it to you, obviously, just in 2D for this. Uh, the uh, What I'm going to describe here is something that you would do for both sides. So the first thing that you are going to do is go through uh, and uh, take a look at how to be able to repair uh, the damage. I do have a book on how to do this. I can talk about that. I'm going to focus tonight, though, uh, just on how to do colorizations because uh, that was the request to be able to do that. So you can go through and to be able to clean some of these things up uh, so that you're putting it back. In this case, I wasn't interested in the background, so I actually just replaced the background uh, with a more neutral background uh, for that, and then I started coloring in the images. So I'm writing in the color uh, the way that it is, and then I'm changing the opacity so that it will blend through to the image. So I'm picking different areas, and I'm choosing a color. Now, in some areas, like the uniform, I know exactly what the color is because I can go out and I can uh, see a copy of that, and I can sample it. In some areas, like with her dress, I have no idea what it is, so I'm looking at something that was of the period. So I'm finding colors from that particular period and trying to be able to match those uh, for that. Uh, in some cases, I can be fairly close. In some cases, uh, that I know that it was either a dark color or a light color because of uh, the quality of what's happening there for that, but I may not necessarily know exactly what the color is. So as we're starting to see those, uh, we've done everything except for uh, we've done just about everything except for their skin tones. And when we do that, in my opinion, this is when it actually starts to really pop in there. And then you start to really see it in color uh, compared to what we had. So uh, that was uh, just a quick on that. Let's talk about how this works and why this works in here. So in this particular image, uh, there are two soldiers here. Uh, one, a very dark-skinned uh, African-American, along with a very light-skinned uh, individual uh, standing right next to him. Now, you'd think that you'd actually have to colorize both of these separately and differently but you don't. So in this case, what I did was I actually went through and I put the exact same color tones on both soldiers. No difference, nothing that I'm doing on here. And then I'm gonna change the opacity. And you'll notice that because that it recognized in the gray tones that it was either darker or lighter, uh, that it properly compensated for that uh, to be able to make that as a color image uh, for that. So what do you need to be able to do it? First, you're going to need a computer. I would recommend a computer, not a tablet, because you're going to want to do layers. There's some other things you're going to want to need. So I'd strongly suggest using a computer. And then uh, you're going to need uh, a mouse to be able to do it. I actually am using uh, a drawing pad, uh, and I actually have a drawing pin uh, in here. Um, actually, let me turn my screen off so that I can show the pin in here. So I have a drawing pin in there, and then I use that on a drawing pad to be able to go through and to be able to draw on the image uh, because that uh, trying to do it with the mouse, uh, it isn't quite as fine and precise. It's more of a challenge to be able to do it. Uh, so I find it easier to be able to do it. Then you're gonna need a drawing program, Photoshop, Photoshop Elements, GIMP, a free tool for that. There's also uh, some older versions of Photoshop that are free that you can get uh, directly from Adobe. Uh, so get one of those. You don't have to pay anything. There are free versions of that. You can pay, obviously, if you want to uh, for that. Uh, and then uh, if you don't already have the images as a digital, uh, you'll need a scanner for that. In my case, I'm going to show you how to be able to find the original black and white negatives for some of the ones that we're looking for. And you can go pick them up from there. To be able to colorize your image, you want to find the right colors in there. So for example, what color is the sky? What color are uh, denim jeans? Uh, what color is the ocean? It'd be blue, blue, and blue. So here is a picture of a clear blue sky filled with blueberries and blue jeans while the blue angels fly overhead and the blue man group performs. It's not all blue. It's different colors. We need to be able to make sure that we get the right color for everything. So what I do is that I go and I take uh, images of contemporary images, either of the location. So here's different images of water. Here's an image of Stephanie, and I can get skin tones, grass, leaves, plants, flowers, sky, 
And when I'm doing those, I'm gonna sample those. I'm gonna take uh, a, a my uh, a Photoshop and I'm gonna put the eyedropper on there and get a color so that I can see different color tones. In here, I actually just have some very basic ones in here. When I do this now uh, that I typically have for wood, for example, I have eight different uh, uh, types of wood elements in there. I think I have about uh, 10 or 12 ones for grass in there. I have uh, three or four different ones for skin tone, a couple of different ones for dirt. I have about five of those. Uh, I typically uh, use about 80 to 90 layers of color in there to be able to do that. Uh, this is just a, you know kind of a, a starting point just to give you an idea for that. When you're applying the color, you want to go in and you want to be able to do that on a layer so that you can actually control it. You're not actually putting it directly onto the black and white. You're putting it sort of above of that. So you're putting it on there and then you're gonna outline the area in there. You're gonna fill in the color for that. And then you're going to change the blending mode to allow that to do it. And then you'll adjust the opacity as needed. So here's an example. Here's a finished image uh, in here uh, for uh, one of the ones of, of for the Civil War in there. And I'm gonna go in here and we're going to go in and see this in black and white. And we're gonna focus in on our hands. So let's actually zoom in on that. So here's what I do to be able to do this. I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna outline the image. So I'm gonna outline the image completely for what it is that I want to colorize. Once I've done that, then I'm gonna go ahead and fill that in. After I've done that, I need to go back and I need to fill in these areas that are missing. So I'm gonna go in and, and uh, retrace the outline to be able to fill that in. And then we change the opacity and now we have it in color. We're gonna continue doing that for each of the other elements. This is not a shortcut. You're gonna to need to spend some time with this. Also, when you're doing this in stereo, you're going to need to do the left and right side separately. You can't just copy it. You need to do those independently. Here's a challenge though. You see the bottom portion with the soldiers? It looks great. Let's actually take a look at the sky that's above them. We did it in blue. This is one that I sampled from the sky and you can see in here, you know that it's not right, but you don't know what's wrong because you sampled it from the sky. Shouldn't it look right like it does with the soldiers? Shouldn't it look right like it does with the cannons, with the grass? All those other elements came out what happened with the sky. Trouble with the sky is that it actually is not one continuous color. It is a gradient of colors in there. And you notice here that the sky is darker. Let me get it caught up there, there we go. The sky is darker at the top than it is at the bottom. So we want to be able to have that uh, so that those are actually uh, there uh, with the right uh, colors that we want. So in here, what we're going to do is that we're gonna make it darker at the light and uh, darker at the top, lighter at the bottom. And now we have one uh, that has the type of colors uh, that we would like to be able to see and what it is that we were expecting in here. Here we go, There's, uh, there it is. I just saw it show up on my other screen. So we're seeing it in here with that type of color that we're expecting and we're seeing that type of uh, quality that we're seeing in there. So just to recap on here, you wanna obtain your image, repair any of the damage, which I didn't talk about tonight, colorize the image, uh, and uh, then uh, you'll have it. So uh, any questions on this about what we're talking about here, uh, anything that I can answer for uh, for anybody on here? Yes, David? Yes, sir. Is this still your current book? This one? Yes. Yes, the it is. I'm holding up. Looks yes, like it, it is. is. So okay. it is my current one. Uh, I actually uh, have uh, I've considered this for the last couple of years, uh, yeah. that the, the basic principles that I have in this book uh, that I still utilize, uh, however, uh, that I've actually... Um, I've actually uh, improved uh, a number of the techniques. And so there's a number of them uh, that I actually have more enhanced techniques than what are in there, uh, but I haven't updated the book for that. So I would like to be able to go back and update that book. I plan to do that at some point when I get a free moment, uh, you know, maybe if, uh, uh, you know, if there's like a worldwide virus or something where it shuts down everything for a little, a couple of months, that'll give me time to do that. But uh, so far I haven't found the time, but uh, yeah, I would like to, uh, but Amen. yeah, that is my current book. David, you mentioned um, blend modes, mm. uh, but you never went back to that. So what, if any, blend mode do you use? Or you're just using opacity to get these things to overlay? So you do, uh, there's a, when you go into the blend mode within Photoshop, uh, that uh, there are, uh, there are three major blend modes that I typically use. I'll use color, uh, I'll use um, uh, overlay, and uh, that I'll use uh, soft light. Soft light is the one that I personally prefer. Uh, the book describes it using color. Uh, uh, typically these days I use soft light. 
uh, I get a more realistic uh, tone out of there, uh, in my opinion, to be able to do that uh, than uh, what I do uh, with the uh, with the color overlay. But I do I still do use color and overlay in certain situations. So typically, I'll do it for one of those three. But you still also then use a opacity. You don't go at a hundred percent. Yeah, well, I'll adjust that depending on what it is. So uh, that. Uh, oftentimes, I will adjust the opacity down so that I don't want it quite so intense. However, there are certain situations where I actually need it to be stronger than what it is. Uh, and so I'll go in and put in a hue and saturation adjustment layer on top of that. And then uh, it's not described in the book, unfortunately. That's one of the reasons why I want to update the book. Uh, but it will go in there and allow you to be able to uh, take it from, for example, 100% to 200%, 300%, 500%, and you can actually go higher percentages. And there are certain situations, uh, for example, uh, with the uniforms in here. Uh, if you notice the uniforms on the cover here, uh, that in my opinion, a little bit light. And if I was doing this again, in fact, I've redone this particular image uh, and that these, uh, these uniforms are a bit darker. I don't have it uh, in this example, but if you look at uh, the image, uh, oops, let me move the other way. So if you look at the image uh, that's uh, behind me uh, on the screen here, uh, you'll see that the uh, the images uh, for their uniforms are a bit darker than what it is on here, and that's using that hue and saturation layer uh, that goes a little bit beyond uh, what it is uh, that was available just with a color option in there. Okay, I'm, I'm guessing that if you use uh, if you apply anything like the hue saturation, you you use a clipping mask so it only applies to the level that you're. Uh, yeah, correct. absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And, and I, I don't talk about mask in that uh, particular book, but uh, yeah, absolutely. I make heavy use of mask. In fact, uh, that um, uh, all of the uh, colorizations that I've done uh, for about the last uh, seven or eight years uh, are done exclusively with mask, uh, both for the color addition on there, as well as uh, any of the uh, adjustment layers that I add on top. So typically I'll add in uh, an adjustment layer for uh, for uh, hue and saturation. I'll add in a curves adjustment layer. Uh, I'll add in a levels uh, sometimes for that. Uh, I'll, I'll typically add a, a few more on there, uh, you know, depending on what's needed to be able to do that. Uh, other questions there? I highly recommend getting David Richardson's book. It's excellent. I keep it near my computer all the time. Thank you. I, I, love, appreciate that. I love to colorize and I've learned a lot from you. Thank you. Uh, if you want to spend some time on there, uh, you know, certainly these days, let me know. I'd be happy to be able to show it to you. Uh, let's actually talk about where you can get some of those. Uh, that If you go over uh, to uh, the Library of Congress uh, on there, uh, you can actually uh, get uh, a number of these uh, from here. Uh, so if you go to the Library of Congress, uh, if you when you first go there, you're starting to just dive around here, and it's a little hard to be able to go through and to be able to find things. Uh, that uh, if you want, what you want to see is you want to look at the collections. And the collections are where you're really going to be able to find what you have. So if you go into the digital collections, it will show you groups of those. And this, there's page after page of these uh, in the collections area. So I've actually bookmarked a number of those, and I'll put some links into the chat area for those. Two of them that I would recommend for that. This is my favorite one. Civil War glass negatives on here. And if you go over here, you notice that there is 8,000 original glass negatives. If you go into one of those, uh, let's actually go and find a stereo one. So I want to be able to find a stereo uh, a photograph from there. Uh, so I'm just going to type in a stereograph. And it's going to show me the, uh, no, I've got stereographs in there. Uh, let me just try stereograph. You're missing an E. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's got stereograph. That's what happens when you're trying to talk and 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 trying to you know uh, do these at the same time. So you'll notice here, for example, this one is uh, both sides. Uh, if you look at this uh, particular one in here, uh, this is going to be a cross view uh, for that. And then you're going to see other ones. When you're lo first looking at the image on here, in fact, uh, this one here is should be this one that I have. Oops, uh, i got to turn my background back on. Uh, for some reason, it's not showing my background. That's okay. Uh, so uh, this one in here uh, is, if you look at it in here, it will show the image in here. 
And then, is this the one that I'm looking for? Let me just see. So I'm not seeing the other half of this. Let's go into one. Uh, a number of them actually just have a single one uh, for that. Uh, but when you go through these, uh, that it will actually have both. And so most of these will have both sides of that uh, here. It says two negatives for that and three negatives in this case uh, for that. So uh, when you go into that, uh, you'll see uh, the first one and then you'll see the second one. And it will have both sides of those. And notice that one side of that is 102 megabytes. And then the other side of that is 95 megabytes for that uh, in there. And then sometimes, like in this case, you'll see a broken piece of that uh, from the original glass plate. Uh, and sometimes you won't in there and you'll see that. So uh, that if we look, for example, at like uh, the uh, three Confederates at, at Gettysburg on there, uh, and uh, we said uh, prisoner, and if we go searching for that one, we should find it pretty quick. There they are. So this is probably the most famous image uh, from uh, the war in here uh, for that. Uh, and you see the both the left and right in there and it tells you which one is which. Uh, most of the time they're right. I have found a few of them where uh, that they'll have the right and left uh, wrong in there. So you may need to adjust those, but you can go through and download those. That is the best area for me to be able to see those. In addition to that, other areas that I see, the Brady Handy Collection. Uh, Matthew Brady, uh, it was either his nephew or uh, one of the, uh, one of the um, assistants that he had, uh, inherited the collection uh, following uh, Brady's death. And so Handy is, is the other guy in there, but this is Matthew Brady's collection. When you look at the Matthew Brady collection in here, there are thousands of images in here. Most of them are studio images and you have to go and look for these uh, ones. So for example, I see John uh, Nic uh, Nicoli, uh, how are we pronouncing that? That you'll see the same image in here and it will look like, and if you go in there, there is just a single version uh, of that and then it will not have the matching half. Those are the ones from this uh, stereo camera that uh, Bob was, I'm sorry, from the studio camera that Bob was talking about with the multi lenses on there. If you go in there though, and you look many, many times, you'll find the other half. So Simon Cameron, for example, uh, he exists in here uh, multiple times. So if we put him in, uh, we're going to be able to find him and we're going to be able to find him in stereo. And then you can go in and you can find the other half. So you're gonna to have to go and do some investigative work to be able to find those terrific uh, options to be able to do that. Uh, the final area that there is <clears throat> in there is that the uh, Library of Congress actually has uh, a stereo card collection. And if you go into that collection, you can search on Civil War and you'll find uh, several hundred of them in there uh, for that collection but great uh, images on there. I will put some links in there for that. In addition to that, the other one that I really like is the National um, Archives uh, uh, collection. Uh, they have a tremendous group of images in there. Uh, you can go directly to their website and search for them, but they're harder to find. It's actually much easier to be able to find if you go out uh, to uh, their uh, collection here. Uh, when you're looking at these images, most of these are 2D. They do not have the 3D. However, if they're on a single plate, uh, and I'm trying to see if I can find one here real quick. If they're on a single plate uh, that has uh, both the left and right, you will see uh, both of them uh, there uh, as, a, uh, as a cross view uh, on, the, uh, on the image. Uh, and so it will have those. Uh, so you kind of have to go through there and to be able to stumble across them. Uh, but they do exist with the stereo uh, views on here. You just kind of have to kind of dig through them uh, to be able to find them uh, in there. And then there's there's great views on there. The quality for those is not as good. Uh, for, here's one, for example, it's about, uh, over and under for that. Here's another over and under, uh, more over and under. So you see uh, some ones in here for three views. Uh, they have them uh, you know, uh, over and under for these. Uh, but if you go and play with these, you're going to get them. Most of them are left and rights in there for that. So the uh, the ones from the National Archives, they're okay. They're not as high quality as the ones from uh, the uh, Library of Congress, and they don't uh, print both sides. They only print one side if it was on a single plate. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, you got a lot of half stereo views on there. Uh, questions about uh, those things, about any of the other stuff that I've mentioned? Uh, I don't want to take too much more time there for that. I guess I have one, David. Um, what did you mention the left and the right file size would be different? Um, the Originally, they're all taken on a single glass plate negative. Uh, and so when they cut them, uh, that uh, sometimes uh, they wouldn't be the same size uh, for each side for that. 
uh, and uh, that sometimes uh, the, uh, they actually uh, would reprint the same image. Uh, that there are a number of examples of the images uh, where you can actually see uh, a person's hand, uh, where you can see their fingers, where they're holding the negative in place, uh, and they actually took a copy negative of that. And so sometimes it's actually a reproduction of the plate that you're actually looking at. It's not the original one in there for that. And so you'll see variances. Mostly they're not too much different in there for that. Uh, and that so, uh, and when you run them through Stereo Photo Maker, you won't really notice any differences. Uh, they're going to be pretty much the same size. Uh, but most of the ones from uh, the Library of Congress, uh, if they have the plates separated where they can actually cut them in half, they're typically around 100 megabytes per side on there. Uh, if they are uh, on a single plate on there, uh, that uh, they are around 45 megabytes. So uh, personally, I like the ones that they have the split plates because you get the larger resolutions, uh, but the other ones uh, that um, they they didn't enlarge, uh, when they were doing the scanning, they, they didn't uh, enlarge the resolution for those. So unfortunately, those ones are only about a quarter of the size uh, for uh, than the ones that are uh, of the uh, ones where they had cut the plates in half. David, there's a question for you from the chat uh, asking if you've compared any of your um, manually done colorizations to what can be done with some of the <laughs> online sites like MyHeritage and DeepAI.org. Oh, uh, so a uh, good question. Uh, so uh, there are a few, um, there are a few tools uh, that have come about recently that will allow you to be able to go in and to be able to do uh, more of an automated colorization on there. Uh, th is, I'm assuming that's what we're asking about, Eric, where you just put up the yes, uh, yes. black and white negative and it, it colorizes it for you. Uh, yes. Yeah, have... and they're they're using uh, mm -hmm. yeah they're using an AI to kind of analyze the photo and determine what colors to put in. Yeah, I have played with a couple of those. Uh, interesting stuff on there for that. Uh, the uh, the real difference, in my opinion, is uh, and uh, let me see if I can get my let me see if I can get my um, video to go back. Oh, OK. You see the, the background screen on here for that. Uh, when you are doing these, and when you're going into the color, uh, when you're looking at the color for these, let me get out of the way of this image in here. When you're doing the color on these, uh, that uh, the AI on there for that, it, it, it doesn't really uh, give you more fine detail for that. Uh, you can get color, but you can't really go um, and uh, put some contrasting shading in there and 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 do some more detail work on there. So they're good, uh, but uh, and I've run it against uh, some of those, uh, but I find them as an interesting starting place. Uh, but uh, the the I don't think the AI is quite there yet. Maybe in a couple of years, but right now it's 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 a good starting plate. But it's more like the difference between. Um, you know, seeing how Van Gogh uh, did when he had a crayon set and he was five years old uh, versus uh, the work that he did later in his life. It's <laughs> not the same. Uh, there's also a question um, about the publicly available Library of Congress files seem rather uh, small. Do they have higher resolution scans available? So the, the publicly available Library of Congress ones are 100 megs per side in there. Uh, they are the equivalent of uh, a I'm trying to remember, or 45 megapixel camera is what it is. So I'm not sure what it is that you want to be larger than that, but they are darn large uh, that you may have uh, seen. I guess, one, uh, I, guess one, I guess one thing to point out is that the Library of Congress makes them available as JPEGs, GIFs, and TIFFs, and the correct. TIFF is going to be the highest quality yeah. version of it. I always take the TIFF. I don't take anything else. I always take the highest resolution one. Absolutely. Don't even bother with the others, in my opinion. On the other hand, I, I should say uh, that I've got an eight terabyte server uh, to be able to hold data, uh, and I've got six terabytes uh, just filling up these type of images on there. Oftentimes when I'm working on uh, the colorization uh, for that, the Photoshop file uh, to be able to hold uh, the repairs, to be able to hold uh, the coloring, to be able to hold all the layers and things, uh, just for one side uh, can get to be a gigabyte uh, just for one side of the image and then I've got to do the same thing for the other side. So it does get intense. 
You and might mention, David, that you could print the image quite large, 30 by 40 inches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so uh, because of the print size for that, uh, that the, uh, the resolution and the quality is just amazing on there. Uh, if you take the largest size for that, uh, we have a print uh, manufacturer that we use uh, to be able to do our uh, online prints at, at our website uh, and that uh, they actually can print up to 30 by 45 with that. Uh, and I've seen some others uh, come out of, uh, of some other countries uh, that can go up to 50 or 60 inches uh, for the ones that uh, came from the original Library of Congress uh, image. So you're going to get some huge, huge, huge uh, image sizes uh, and, uh, and uh, quality uh, images uh, from there. Uh, so just fantastic stuff from that. David, what version of Photoshop are you using? Uh, personally, I'm using Photoshop 5. Um, it, the 6 came out, and then they went to an online subscription model, and you've got to pay every month or every year to be able to do that. So I've got one of the last ones uh, prior to them uh, going to that you have to pay on a regular basis for that. However, uh, that uh, for if you're interested in doing either the repairs or if you're interested in doing uh, things like uh, the colorizations. You don't need the later versions. You don't need to pay for the license. You don't need to pay for the subscriptions. There are free versions. There's a free version of Photoshop CS2 uh, that you can get directly from Adobe to be able to do that. There's also free programs. Unfortunately, like, Adobe recently took that link down. Uh, I have. Uh, Sadly, I, Adobe I, recently took that link down. I have archived that one. If anybody has an interest in that, uh, I do have that one uh, stashed away. Uh, the so, only thing uh, I will interject in there is I think it was with CS5 is when they made a significant improvement in the functionality of layers and layer adjustments. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason that's significant is, is that's when they made it, made a lot of things available as layer adjustments, which means you can go back in and adjust them after mm -hmm. you've done it. So you're working on an image and later you decide, like you say, gee, those trousers are a little too light. It's very mm -hmm. easy in the later versions where you have layer adjustments to then go in and just grab that one layer and make a change non-destructively without affecting anything else you've done subsequently. Um, so I, CS2 will do it, but I'm pretty sure it's CS5 and above that really give you the layer adjustment functionality that if you're doing something with a lot of layers, it makes a huge yeah. difference. Yeah, that's what I'm doing with CS5. And like I said, I typically have 80 to 90 layers uh, for the ones that I'm doing uh, for that, and you're gonna need that for that. Uh, the other, if you if you're not wanting to pay for a license for that, uh, the other one that I would recommend uh, would be uh, probably uh, GIMP. Uh, it, it's it's a great tool. It does most of the things. In fact, it does basically everything in there. Uh, the uh, the tools are a little bit different, uh, but uh, basically the the concept and the ability to delete layers and that one's completely free. It's uh, one that uh, is available uh, if you uh, just go uh, search on. Uh, it's a new uh, image. Uh, manipulation tool, uh, GIMP. If you just go search on that, you'll you'll find it there, uh, and you can download that one for free. Uh, or you know, uh, certainly if you get one of the paid versions uh, for the, one of the later ones, you can do uh, take advantage of that. Any other questions before we turn it back over to Val? I know I went a bit longer than I was uh, expecting, but uh, or had anticipated. But uh, I appreciate uh, questions. Uh, if if people do have other questions for me. Uh, that uh, certainly I'm available at any time, uh, let me know. Uh, and uh, that, uh, you know, if you want to be able to uh, take a look at uh, some of the stereos from my site, uh, that uh, actually, let me let me do that real quick. We'll just go over to my site real quick and put in. And I'll, uh, I'll remind everyone as well. Uh, we'll put We'll put links to all of this stuff in the chat. And if you want to save it to visit the sites later, you can go into the chat window. At the bottom right where it says file, if you click on the three dots, you have the option to save the chat to your local disk. And you can go back and reference all the links that are in the chat on your own later. So uh, just a real quick one uh, on my site, if you're interested in any of the colorization ones, uh, that you can go in here. So for example, uh, that I want to be able to see the ones in here uh, from uh, Gettysburg uh, that we had talked about this evening in here. And you can go in there and that I have uh, stereos for these. Um, and of course, it's taking a little bit longer to be able to do this. I have them as uh, stereo cards in here uh, to be able to see them. And then you can go in there and you can view uh, the uh, stereo cards from there. We do have them available for purchase if you're interested in those uh, to be able to see those. Uh, or you can just enjoy them uh, uh, on the screen if you want to be able to uh, take a look at those. 
but some of the same ones that Bob was just going through to be able to talk about them. This building, for example, that I actually had to go back and find the original colors uh, for what that was. Uh, here is, uh, you know, other images from there. This is that one of the body that was dragged 73 yards that Bob was talking about. This is that particular body in there for that. So those kind of things, that's what we're looking at here. Uh, the, you know, uh, some of those images. Uh, I have, um, I, I don't know, I, I've done 600 of them, probably about 200 of them or so are uh, Civil War stereos that I have on my site. So, uh, you know, welcome to uh, take a look at those uh, in there uh, if you, uh, you know, if you're interested in that sort of thing. So let me just stop that. All right, Val, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Well, awesome, David. One thing based on what you just showed me. Uh, let's see, here we go. I knew nothing about this before David was talking about it. And based on what he just said, I did the following. I took a black and white image of Mars and I did this to it. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it's that simple. Yeah, it's it's uh it's not not difficult to do if you uh, want to spend a few minutes uh you know playing in there uh, with that. Thanks. Very fun. <laughs> Thank you, David, for that really in-depth presentation. I think all Thank of us you. are going to be anxious to try some of these techniques out. And Good. um and David Kunz, I think that's great that you jumped right in there and did one so quickly. So very inspiring. Well, it looks like from what I can see so far, we have four people that want to present a, sh a show and tell. And the first to sign up was Cassie. Cassie, would you like to get started? Yes. So I went to Dollar Tree the other day and they had these socks. Oh, <laughs> I they got 3D glasses <laughs> and little popcorns on them. So you get, you get two pair. The other side's not very exciting, but um, they only had a couple of pair. And then I went to the other Dollar Tree near me and they only had a couple of pair. So. I thought they were very cute very for a buck. Fun. Awesome. And then we have this other very thing, uh, which is a dog toy. I don't know if anybody's ever seen this. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's a little the dog view, toy. View fetcher. <laughs> it's, a, it's the I view fetcher. I think we need that. And this comes out. I if, think we do. If you take this out of the package, the... Uh, the reel comes out, but it's really cute. So, <laughs> hey, I, you you find that? I you have one. Your... I got it from Sheldon Aronowitz, and Hubble is terrified. <laughs> <laughs> we got this one at Target. That's how it. How much? Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Do you remember how much? 10 bucks. It was like 10 bucks. Thanks. Your, is it, do your cats like it? Oh, heck no. <laughs> Fabulous. That's, oh, great. that's very fun and then uh david and susan also would like to share something with the group okay uh let's see i've got to get to share screen here one second um no hold on let's see share screen i think we already are on share screen no, no. i've got to get to Hold on. Sorry about this. Uh, we are seeing your screen now, David. We're seeing uh, the Zoom yeah. page Yeah, I there. just have to, I can't get to, ah, come on. There. So Susan wanted to talk about her Hall of Fame. Well. And oh. her latest edition. I, I redid the, uh, the, the Hall of Fame, this this page yesterday, so that you can see why there there about half of these people were Stereo Club of Southern California or LA 3D Club members. Um, and, you wanted to do and I gave little descriptions to them, and I wanted to mention that the person who started this club was Dr. Harold Lutz, and he was the the man who actually sent out who. He was a PSA member, but he decided to gather up other people and start up a stereo club on his own. So he was the first president of our club. He was the first president. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is what he looked like in, uh, 
1949. That's him in, with the glass, well, the one in the back. Oh, wow. <laughs> with the tie. <laughs> he was also an inventor and, and he, uh, he, he made two 3D projectors and a, a wonderful yeah, light he, box. Yeah, he designed the Comco uh, Triad stereo projector and also the later model, the Comco, Comco 500. 500. There's the uh, patent drawings. And a, some of his photos. And the Lutz film cutter. Yeah, the Lutz cutter was a, uh, well, I guess it doesn't come out much bigger. It was an automated cutter that would automatically go five perforations at a time. And uh, here we have wow. a bigger picture of it. Anyway, the Hall of Fame now has about 25 different people on it and uh, about 1,100 pictures. And every picture you can you can open it up if you want to download it to your own computer. You're welcome to do that. It's easy to do. Um, so everything is available, and it's a free site to to look at. Um, so just wanted to introduce you and tell you that it's more up to date. And that's one of those colorized with the cheap. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was a newspaper article. So Susan colorized the newspaper article. So I'll stop sharing. Yeah. Oh, and, and I, was, have, I have a second show and tell. Sure. Yeah. I just wanted to say, Susan, thank you so much for putting all that wonderful work into that project for all of us to enjoy and to really capture history. I think it's something that our club and others will really enjoy looking at. Thank you. Thank you very much. I second that. All right. Well, <laughs> yeah. I was going to do a show and tell with a camera, but uh, since the Civil War was the topic today, uh, to show this is a, let's see if it's not too, this is a, was an item we sold many years ago. Uh, trying to get it so it's not, yeah, there you go. Uh, and it's actually just a folder. Let's see here. Uh, with eight stereo views that you you would take these out. It's two-sided and it had a pop-up viewer built in. Oh, uh, nice. To view the a total of, well, it was two, four, six, eight. So nine, there were nine images total. So it was just a very small Civil War item. But, uh, and that was one of the stereo views. So, uh, I don't know how easy it is to find that. It's just called Civil War 3D. eBay. And if anybody's really interested, I'll give you the ISBN number because I'm sure otherwise we Oh, Susan had to show her this latest. Is too, this is too bright. Wait. Yeah. There. This is a, uh, a Christmas ornament Viewmaster. <laughs> is this uh -huh. so cute? I couldn't resist. Yeah. E eBay. Yeah. It's adorable. Isn't it adorable? Yeah. All right. So we better okay, that's it. do okay. on hog show and tell, but thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, thank David, you. for bringing up. That was so uh, attuned to what we're looking at tonight for Civil War. And it's nice to see all the different formats and large books and then also more pamphlets. So thanks for bringing that to the table. Um, is, is Gordon Wu still here? I think Gordon? he left. Oh, okay. Gordon, um, that... Gordon had to go. He's, he's in New York and it's a little late for him. Okay. Oh. Steve Bereson just wrote that he he still offers this item. Oh, can I can I also mention that yes. I talked I talked to Sheldon today. Sheldon Aronowitz. For those of you who know him and love him, um, he's still in the hospital, but he sounds very good. Uh, Thank you for that update. Yeah, that's good that's to know. All, yeah, that's all I'll say. Thank you. Mm. Was there um, any others that would like to share a show and tell tonight? Valerie, I've got one additional, and in addition to all the many Civil War books, uh, there's one the Smithsonian put out that's nice. It's actually a very thick box oh. consisting of a viewer, a fold-out viewer, and um, a number of smaller reproduction views, but they're all very, you know, high quality views. And uh, I don't know if this is still available anywhere, but um, it's worth checking out. So it's also a very good resource 
for additional Civil War views. Oh, very the uh, view reminds me of the old, uh, the ones in the Rombild Verlag uh, German sets. It's <laughs> almost an exact copy of the German Rombild Oh, yeah. Viewer. Yep, yep. Yeah, uh, huh. they, they put I've out got, several other books in that exact same format. There's one on Paris in 3D, and a, I forget what the other. Yes, that's right. Yeah, books are. yeah. They, they've done a New York in 3D. Book, yeah. They have they have a couple of different ones. Yeah, uh, Jim, I have that same book as well. Uh, it, it's a great image. One of the things that I really find interesting in that one is that uh, that they actually have a, a number of stereo images that don't appear in the Library of Congress, the National Archives, or some of the other collections, and they only appear in the Smithsonian. Uh, but unfortunately, those are the only versions of those images they have, and they're very small. I would love to be able to see uh, them offer those in digital format in a larger style, uh, but they just have those small versions uh, of uh, those uh, reproduction stereo cards from there. Uh, but they're, they're great quality images. I do like those. <laughs> Well, I highly recommend if anybody ever finds themselves in Washington, D.C., um, get a, uh, you have to go through a little bit of a process to get yourself a Library of Congress card, but you can literally go into, I think it's the building on Jefferson Street, I think they just call it the Jefferson Building, and inside there is the Prints and Photographs <coughs> Division, and when you go in there, there are, it's like the end of Raiders of Lost Ark, there's row after row of file cabinets, absolutely full of stereo views and on every single on the top of every cabinet there's a pedestal stereoscope and you can literally just spend all day every day in there just wow. going through all the drawers of stereo views it's like i was a kid uh, in a candy store for a few yes. days wow. Hi. That's amazing. Uh, well, can you hear me yep. yes yeah yeah this yep. is steve barrison i did put a link to the cards that david showed okay. on the chat session so mm -hmm. i do still offer those wonderful Great. Thanks, Dave. That's probably where I may have gotten mine because I remember I, I bought a number of items from you. So that's probably where I got it. So thanks for letting us know that's available. Stop chewing on this cable. <laughs> <laughs> um, did, what, does anyone else have a show and tell? Um, I have one that I'll save for the end. Okay. It looks like there isn't anybody else. All right. So my show and tell is a homework assignment for myself. Um, I'm using earphones. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, you sound good. Okay, good. Let me just put this back in because it fell out so I can hear you. <laughs> um, I have an interest, obviously, like all of us, in stereo imagery, stereo cards, Magic Lanterns cards, and I frequently um, – look in antique stores for anything related to that. And I found this one card from the Civil War. So I'm gonna show it to you, then I'll tell you what my homework assignment is. So it's an eagle. And what fascinated me about this wow. is it was the mascot to one of the troops. And after the Civil War, this eagle mascot had great popularity where they set them up in a hotel with a bathtub and people would come in and pay a ticket price to see him. So <laughs> to me, this just begs some type of treatment and I'm gonna start using the beautiful demo we saw tonight and I'm going to colorize it and present it next week. So that's my homework assignment. <laughs> that's great. Ne next week or next month? Oh, yeah, next month. Yeah. Oh, good. I have more time. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful card. Now, if, is that if, the eagle they named Old Abe by chance? I've heard stories of an eagle who traveled with the troops called Old Abe. I don't know if they. Yeah, I, I believe yeah, it is. Old Abe. Looks like it. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that's yeah. so fun. And because right on the back of it, it doesn't list it, but I did look it up. And when I brought it, when I did purchase it and I saw a cap about it um, and which really makes me think when you research something, print it out and put it next to the card so you have it because I'm just <laughs> going by memory on that. <laughs> but thank you. So old Abe, that will help me um, get some research on it. Yeah, I think there were a couple of similar views. I have the one you held up. The oh, okay. Bennett view. I, I'm trying to remember. I think they have a it's just a statue of Old Abe in the Wisconsin State Capitol. 
Oh, lovely. Oh, I, I can't a wait very to find famous it. eagle. <laughs> oh my gosh. This is so fantastic. It, and it's just so nice being a part of this group where someone who's more novel to the history can benefit from the comments, you know, and experiences and the things that people have seen in person. So thank you for bringing that to the table. Yeah, so here's, uh, I just did search on, in fact, when I put in Old Abe, the first thing that came up was eagle on here. Uh, and there's just <laughs> row after row after row of images on here uh, talking about uh, that particular eagle on here. In fact, I think, this, is this the same image that uh, that you had? Oh, no, mine was a That's little a bit different. One. different. Yeah. Slightly different, okay, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, think... I mean, there's there's just tons of them on here about that. Is yeah, her, 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 her image is a little bit lower on the page there. Oh, okay, oh, great. Is it? A different selfie. Yeah, I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking they actually stuffed the original one and it was at the Wisconsin Capitol, but maybe it was destroyed in a fire or something mm. like that. There was some big story that went with it, but I've seen mm. a number of the, I know Bennett had a couple of views of them. Mm. Beautiful. Eagle. There was an article in Sierra World, I'll look for it. Mm. Oh, fantastic. This, yeah, is, speaking, this is this is great. Of, You're doing all my research for me. <laughs> <laughs> my faulty memory, some of us. Well, speaking of Stereo World uh, and the NSA, I want to remind everyone uh, we are now less than a month away from the NSA's virtual 3DCon 2020. Uh, it's going to be held all online. There's uh, four days of workshops, special interest groups, theater. Uh, all kinds of interesting presentations. It is free to attend, uh, although I would highly recommend that you register and uh, um, uh, get yourself the, the goodie bag that includes the commemorative glasses, the lorgnette viewer, all the different viewers you'll need to view the online presentations. Um, and I want to remind everyone, tomorrow is the deadline to submit proposals to the theater. So if you have a show that you'd like to, to uh, submit to 3dcon um, you can go to the website at 3d-con.com uh, it's in the uh, the link is in the chat and uh, all the submission forms for the 3d theater are on the theater tab there don't forget the view master reel in the right goodie that's bag. right yeah oh yes yeah yeah if you get if you get the goodie bag you you get the view master reel you'll get the uh uh the lorgnette viewer You'll get the anaglyph glasses, uh, and I think there's a, there's a couple other uh, special items that you get for registering. Linda, we want to meet your show and tell. My cat. Your cat. Who, who, what's his name? <laughs> Dora. Dora. Dora the Explorer. Oh, <laughs> she's lovely. Va Valerie, I have a short, short, I have a short show and tell. All right. Oh, fantastic. You know, it's, I didn't, I think, I keep forgetting to show these to people, but uh, in 2006, a friend of mine was clearing out his garage. I kid you not. And I don't know if you can see these. I don't know if you can. Yeah, I can see. Yeah. Okay, so this apparently, Monsieur Henry Pentier was the curator of the museum in AIX on Provence, France in 1906. Anyway, so there's, this is a set of eight glass. I'm assuming these are projections. Oh. Um, you know what? Here, let me. Oh, wow. Let me do this. Is that let a me, magic lantern thing you guys were talking about? Let me do this. No. no. Oh. No, that's cool. That's, that's positives. That, that's amazing. They are, they are positives. Have you right. scanned yeah. them? No, I've never scanned them because, quite honestly, I. I just haven't had the time, but I, I'd like oh, to. Do it and, Abe, the negative or a positive? You know what? Just put them They're up. Positives. To, just yes. put them up against a white paper and use your phone. Take a picture of if them. You can see they have the dates on there. Yeah. Nineteen ten. Wow. 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 Very special. And they're they're in they're in like black t uh, tape. tape. Mm hmm. So I don't know if the black tape was, I mean, the box is, is ancient, you know? I, th I think the reason for the black tape is they would put a piece, right. it probably has a piece of clear glass over the emulsion side oh. to protect it from getting scratched. Yep, exactly. Oh, you're probably right. Oh, so that's, that's the reason for the black tape. Okay, so there's film in there and then the, 
It's like no, no. It's no, actually no, it's no. probably a glass plate uh, positive with the emulsion on one side, but the the another piece of glass protects it. Yeah, I, I will try to scan those and and share them with the group. I just yeah, th th those scan beautifully. Yes. They're they're really high resolution. But you can you can just use your phone usually and just take a picture that easily. No, I'll, I'll do it with a proper camera. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, that was a real so treat. Were, Thank were you. Were those meant to be? Were those meant to be uh, viewed in, backlit in a hand viewer? I, I think they were probably projector um, things because they're positives. I mean, here's no, 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 the, they, the, they made they made viewers yeah, but, but view like, for like viewers. The, it's a big slide know, viewer. Yeah, yeah. So there were know, there were viewers, viewers that would have, have a frosted glass back. But we uh, have them all uh, over uh, our house. You've seen them. <laughs> <laughs> We were talking about a magic reaction. <laughs> yeah, it could be that too. It's yeah. nice to see everybody. Here, guys. Well, see you, in in that format, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. They would they would be this put into a hand viewer. viewer that's got a frosted glass back. Okay. Yeah. There's a frosted glass back. Uh, I don't have a slide in this one, but you know, if it's not, there was uh, six by thirteen. There was seven by forty. There in centimeters. Uh, some of them you could open up the back. I uh, have put, I had to put a loop into it, and it's super sharp. Oh yeah, they are sharp as a tack. They scan really beautifully. Yeah, they do. We we have a uh, we have a whole bunch of those in a sequential viewer at the other right. end of the house. <laughs> I remember the first time I scanned a glass slide. I think it was taken in 1897 in Nuremberg, Germany. Wow. And you could tell it was a it was a cha cha because the shadow had slightly moved on the street. But man, I tell you, I couldn't even see when I zoomed all all the way in. I think I scanned it at forty eight hundred DPI on a flatbed, and you could zoom all the way in and read the time on a clock on the church steeple in the distance that you couldn't even see the clock was there. You know, with your naked eye, just the the, the clarity level is huh. unbelievable. Wow, beautiful. Cool, Abe. Thank you. Very cool. Thanks for the show and tell. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. That was a great show and tell. Turn the floor back over to. So are, are, are there any other announcements that anyone wants to make before we close things out? Uh, what's the schedule for the next meeting, uh, Eric? Uh, the, the, next, the next meeting, uh, we're actually going to be celebrating the LA3D Club's 65th birthday. Uh, yeah. And we'll be looking at uh, at the image of the year uh, award winning images from this past year's competition, and uh, we'll be taking a look at some of the LA 3D Club's history. Uh, Are we doing David a banquet? And Susan have actually been scanning. Uh, well, it'll be a, a virtual banquet. Well, I'll gather here, and you can bring your own food. I had dinner during uh, the presentation tonight. <laughs> yeah, we have a virtual potluck. <laughs> By the way, is the restaurant going to be saved or not? Because I remember you guys were sharing something about that. <laughs> Who knows? Next. Probably be a while before they tear it down. Or They were supposed to preserve a restaurant or maybe uh, rebuild a small restaurant within the larger complex. Whether that's going to happen or not, who knows? Are you talking about take, the Takes restaurant? Yes. yes. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah. yeah. The I'm plan is to put a, a six or seven-story condo building there. Oh well, highest and best use. Yeah, yes. best. probably six totally or seven great. stories of condos and no parking. Right. Yeah. Mm. There's hardly any parking around there. You're not gonna have underground parking? No, they're pretty. No. Nice. This is L.A. Probably for the for the uh, tenants. Yeah. Well, is, yeah zoning a certain amount yeah. of work. So 65 years ago, this week was the first meeting of the Stereo Club. This week. Oh, wow. Where, where was it? It was at the at uh, Plummer Park, arranged oh, okay. by Harold Lute, Harold Lutz. Wow. Yeah, uh, Susan and David have been scanning all of the club's early documents, including the invitation them. to the first meeting. Wow. Yeah. It, we have scanned it's everything. A real treasure chest of we're, stuff. We're working on a website on Wix. So if I can 
yeah. figure it out again. Uh, Susan has made a start on a Wix site for the archive. I have made a start, but it's like starting over. Oh, wonderful. That's awesome. So, so it's not public yet. <laughs> well, uh, well, uh, as it is as it is right now, the the documents do exist though uh, in scanned PDF form. Yes. Yeah. Everything now, and we keep yeah. finding more. Well, we still have a lot to scan. Oh yeah, yeah not everything, but yeah. almost everything. Uh, yeah. It's a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question. But uh, it's. it's I, have, I have yeah. a question for Eric and uh, David and Susan. Um, you remember the 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 Sturgis and Sturgis sure. program that I yes. put together yeah. some years ago. Yes. Well, I'm I'm just really afraid that all those images, which I know you scanned as some of them, but they're still sitting here in Baywood in the in the attic of that house, and um, his wife, excuse me, his daughter is still alive, but um, and and she's she's living with her uh, her daughter, but I'm just afraid that when he passes when she passes away. They might literally just throw that stuff away, and I, I just, I just, I don't know. I hate to see it happen. And Abe, I don't know. Let, Abe, let them know that you're interested in it, or, or that, or that the Stereo Club is, or somebody is. Just know, let spot. them know. Let them know that it's wanted. So you know, remind her that you know Sturgis was a member of the club for God knows how many years, and uh, if you remind her that the club has a a, a slide library and you know, to donate them to the well, stereo in fact, club. If, 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 she want, if she can donate it to the club, if she wants to take a tax write-off on it, 3D Space is a 501c3 nonprofit, she could donate it to our museum collection. There's a number of places that it could go where it could be safely preserved. Yeah. I'll tell you how many boxes there are. There's, there's probably, can you see how big my hands are? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's probably 10 boxes this big filled with glass slides. Yeah. Well, at one point, Abe, wow. we did go wow. over after Sturgis passed away. We asked Maudie if we could have some a few of his slides for the club slide library, and we went over to the house, and most of those, most of his boxes, he took a whole roll of film of every picture. So, oh. so a lot there's of duplicates. so there's wow. thirty okay. of the same because he entered. He was very competitive, and he entered competitions with the same slide. And so he wanted 30 originals. And so he took, he had many, many, many originals. And so while it looks like there's a ton of slides, we did get a bunch from, from Maudie and, and also um, the ones that he w entered in competition in the club were digitized. Okay. Um, also the Photographic Society of America um, has over the years has had some that were digitized that are out there. So, but let, let his daughter know that you're interested, the club is interested, that, uh, that there are places that, that want these things. I will. Uh, don't, don't wait, because you know, now is the time. I'm gonna do it tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrow's good. Great. Promise? Promise. <laughs> Can I offer a, uh, a comment from Syracuse? Yes. Syracuse. So Syracuse, sure. Yeah. Thank you very Syracuse. much for allowing me to join a little bit late here. Oh, awesome. Okay. I'm going to Hi. Presentation about uh, Civil War in 3D. And uh, here in Syracuse, we have a really beautiful uh, Civil War monument, a Soldiers and Sailors monument. Uh, I have a few pictures of that up on Ferio. Um, and they restored this monument a few years ago. They, they took the, uh, the bronzes down, sent them out to be cleaned, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, did some repairs to the base. And I know a number of uh, Northeast cities at least has some uh, soldiers and sailors monuments for the Civil War, uh, maybe not so much in California. And at this time, there's lots of Civil War monuments uh, of Southern uh, leaders that are being uh, destroyed. Yeah. So I think as an adjunct to the presentation today, it would be interesting to put together one of monuments to the Civil War currently standing and, and, and destroyed recently. That would be an interesting follow-on. Mm -hmm. Most of them are not being destroyed, they're just being moved. Now, some are though. I know, a, a, few, a few are being destroyed or have sure. been. Yeah. But if they're moved, we may not, we're not going to see them again. Some of them though, you, you realize some of them were put up 20 years ago. <laughs> 
Well, just to just to keep that in mind, I mean, it's not like they go back 100 or 150 years ago. Yeah. Uh, Speaking of uh, Civil War monuments, uh, if you go uh, just across the street uh, from uh, the Center for Civil War or the uh, Center for the Arts in uh, Pasadena, uh, there is a Civil War statue that is literally across the street from where we have our meetings. Wow. Okay. wow. Never noticed it. I did not know that. In that, you know, that little, Yeah, oh. that little park oh. that's right there. There's a Civil War statue right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's oh. beautiful. So go check it out next time when, whenever that, we get back there is it, isn't there, get some rope uh, and pull it down yeah is there a veterans <laughs> building next to it it's, it's in the park. Uh, there was a uh, actually an uh, the original uh, library uh, building was there um so the original library building is right next to it you see like the entrance to that uh, i don't remember a veteran area for that uh, was the, the armory actually an armory uh, i believe it was uh, yeah. In fact, the uh, the Pasadena Civil War Roundtable uh, that's actually uh, from uh, the uh, from their website uh, that that particular photograph that I just showed, uh, and the uh, the Civil War Roundtable uh, meets uh, at the library. These days, actually, they're meeting online. They're using my GoToMeeting session. I set up one for them as well. Uh, so we're doing stuff for that. In fact, I did a presentation for them recently on um, colorizations of uh, Civil War images uh, that I had done uh, for them. So, but that was a 2D presentation that I did share with the group. Yeah. According to the city of Pasadena's official website, uh, that park, which is known as Memorial Park at Raymond and Walnut, uh, has a Civil War memorial that was dedicated on Memorial Day 1906. Wow. It's inscribed, erected by the citizens of Pasadena to perpetuate the memory of the defenders of the union 61 to 65. What a lot of people don't realize is that uh, after the Civil War, a large number of uh, the original, uh, you know, um, inhabitants of uh, California uh, in the Los Angeles area actually were Civil War veterans. Uh, there was actually a number of veterans homes uh, that were in uh, the Southern California area, uh, Los Angeles, Pasadena included uh, in there, and that uh, the, uh, they actually had uh, quite a few of those uh, for a number of years. Uh, in fact, um, that the area where the Huntington Library is today, uh, that uh, prior to uh, the Huntington's uh, purchasing that, uh, that uh, piece of property was actually owned uh, by uh, George Patton's family, uh, and that uh, his family uh, lived there for quite a number of years. Uh, and there was a, a, a soldier uh, known as, or a, a, an individual known as uh, Colonel Mosby. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but uh, he was a Confederate raider. He would go out and raid uh, the Union lines, and he would take a small group. They would go out on missions, and they would raid uh, the areas, and they would uh, go in and terrorize the, uh, the community, and then they would disappear. And, and that happened over and over and over again. Very famous uh, for doing that type of thing. Uh, following the war, he actually ended up in uh, Pasadena, uh, met George Patton when uh, Patton was about 10 years old, and he took him out and he showed him the tactics that he had uh, used uh, during the Civil War uh, and that uh, Patton learned some of the techniques that he used during the Second World War uh, from uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Confederate raider. Uh, Patton's family were all uh, Confederate uh, he was descended from a line of uh, Confederate uh, soldiers, uh, and so uh, he actually uh, had gone there and uh, and used those tactics uh, that he learned uh, and applied them to tanks during the Second World War. So it's kind of an interesting segue uh, uh, yeah. from the uh, Civil War uh, over to uh, the Second World War uh, to be able to think about uh, that connection there from that. Absolutely. Yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot of interesting history uh, regarding the Civil War in this area. Uh, for those of you uh, that are interested there, you know, I mean, obviously that we don't have uh, the battlefields and those things uh, that they do in the East Coast. Uh, there is uh, one uh, facility that is uh, a, there was a, a Civil War uh, era Union uh, camp in San Pedro uh, that was actually uh, there. Uh, if you look up the drum barracks, uh, the, the drum barracks uh, was actually 
the only surviving residence uh, that was part of uh, a, a fairly large uh, union encampment uh, that they were used to protect the port of Los Angeles uh, in there and that uh, there are three surviving buildings. Uh, one of them is a house uh, that was uh, an officer's uh, quarters. That's the drum barracks. You can go and visit it these days uh, in there. They've got some interesting displays, including a Gatling gun. It's fairly interesting. Uh, there is uh, a, a, a small building that is a, a short distance from there uh, that was used as uh, a, um, an ammunition uh, depot. Uh, and it's, uh, it doesn't look very interesting, but historically it's significant. And then the third remaining Civil War building that's in the Los Angeles area, interestingly enough, is on Catalina Island. Uh, and it's actually uh, now used as part of uh, the Catalina Yacht Club. It's owned by them, but uh, it actually was originally a Civil War uh, union structure uh, that was transported out to uh, Catalina following the war uh, and is now... Uh, I mean, there's nothing to indicate that it was there, but but uh, you know they they have the history of it, and they know that that was actually a Civil War building. Those, those are only three Civil War structures that are remaining in the area. But I mean, we're sitting here in Southern California. There isn't much of the Civil War, except there is these few tantalizing p bits and pieces uh, just here and there that just happen to be there if you know where to look. Thanks, David. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Is well, there it is it is closing in on. Sorry, I was asking if there's anything connected with the Civil War at that you know, whole VA facility in Westwood. Uh, I'm not sure. I'd have to check with uh, some of the people at the Pasadena Roundtable. Uh, yeah. There's about a half a dozen different roundtables in uh, Southern California uh, that uh, are, that focus on uh, the Civil War. Uh, so we could probably find out from one of them. Several of them are historians. They've talked about uh, some of those areas. Uh, the other one that I would look at, I mean, obviously the Huntington Library has a huge collection of Civil War uh, material, just a fantastic collection uh, of Civil War material, artifacts, and a number of things. Uh, the other one, uh, if you're really interested in the Civil War in this area, is the Lincoln Shrine. Uh, I, I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. Uh, the Lincoln Shrine, uh, I forget where it's, it's out in the... Uh, Redlands. Redlands, it's, yeah, it's, it's a ways out there. I've actually gone and talked out there uh, before, but they've they've just got a just a large uh, collection of uh, of uh, random various stuff, uh, all uh, you know original period pieces, a uh, huge uh, collection of stuff uh, there. So uh, definitely worth a look if you're interested in that type of thing. Also at UCLA across the street is the Veterans Cemetery. They have a they have a Civil War section and a little Civil War museum type thing. I'm not exactly sure what it looks like. I just know it's there and it relates to the people who are buried there. The Wadsworth Veterans Home was originally created to house Civil War veterans that had moved to Southern California and that's where, you know, they obviously buried them there. Yeah. So they have um, displays wow. about that wow. section of history. Yeah, if you go out to some of these, uh, 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 some of these cemeteries, uh, there are actually Union uh, sections in the cemeteries, actually even some Confederate ones, mostly Union ones, uh, where that uh, they will actually have uh, a, a complete section dedicated to uh, Civil War soldiers. Uh, and those, uh, you know, those sections in the graveyard uh, were remained open through uh, the 1930s and 40s until the final uh, group of those uh, passed away uh, from there. So it's kind of interesting uh, that, uh, you know, even locally here, that it's uh, very easy to be able to find. Uh, areas where uh, that there are, uh, you know, connections to uh, Civil War uh, veterans and, and uh, original Civil War uh, material uh, that was uh, from the local area, not just something that was uh, imported or brought back, but, uh, you know, uh, a, an original connection from there. You know, David, you made me think of something when you mentioned the lifespan of some of the soldiers buried um, at that cemetery, is right. that they lived and witnessed World War One and World War Two after the Civil War. I just right. never thought about the lifespan of a person being able to go through all three of those. Well, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, in some ways it was like, wow, you know, somebody lived that long uh, for that. Uh, but uh, the last of the uh, soldiers from the Second World War uh, are uh, still alive. I mean, they're in the late 80, uh, their late 90s, uh, early 100s uh, for that. Uh, the uh, 75th anniversary for uh, the Battle of Gettysburg uh, took place in 1938, uh, and uh, so they actually went and filmed it. There's a lot of a lot of good uh, video actually. Uh, if you go to the Library of Congress of soldiers uh, there, um, not the Library of Congress, go to YouTube and you'll find uh, videos of that. 
soldiers uh, going there and going back to Gettysburg and things uh, in 1938 uh, to be able to do that. But that was 75 years ago uh, for there. And so if you think about it, that is really just about the amount of time that there is from us uh, to uh, the uh, to the Second World War, uh, and that uh, you know now we're at about 80 years, and, and soldiers obviously uh, are uh, in are still alive at this point, and so they did uh, survive up until the Second World War. The last surviving uh, documented known uh, individual from uh, the uh, Civil War uh, died in about 1950-51. Uh, so just about 10 years uh, before uh, the uh, 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 before the 100th uh, anniversary of the Civil War uh, was the last one. In fact, the uh, there was an individual. He was five years old. There's a video on him. If you go uh, searching on there, uh, witness to Lincoln assassination. I figured exactly what it was. Uh, so there was a boy who was five years old uh, <laughs> and was in Ford's Theater uh, the night that Lincoln was shot. Uh, wow. And that uh, he was on uh, the um, uh, the show, um, uh, What's My Line, or, or something, I forget what the name of the show was. Uh, but uh, they actually have the entire episode on uh, YouTube, and you can go watch it these days. And it was filmed in 1955, I think. Uh, and this guy was five years old at the time, and that uh, he actually recounts that. He didn't live much longer. He died a year or so later uh, from that, but uh, uh, that, you know, he told about. Uh, his time there, uh, you know, uh, seeing seeing the uh, the play and enjoying it, and then you know being there at the time that uh, Lincoln got uh, was shot. So it's a very uh, very interesting uh, just history from that. But did you get to see House of Wax before he died? On <laughs> 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 a devil, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, David, I wonder if um, you mentioned, uh, I've seen that film footage of the 75th uh, Gettysburg anniversary, and it's just mm -hmm. fantastic with all these old men who, you know, were fighting to the death, right. uh, you know, before that now, shaking hands and reenacting and reminiscing and, you know, old men doing the rebel yell. And I wonder if there was any stereographs taken of either that or the 50th anniversary back in, I guess that would have been, what, 1913. Um, it seems like that would have been prime stereo taking time for somebody to go up and take some pictures of, at those reunions. Have you ever seen anything like that? Uh, so there are stereo images of uh, some of the reunions. I'm not sure about the one uh, from the 75th. Uh, I have seen other ones uh, from various ones uh, earlier than that. Uh, I, I, I don't know specifically uh, from the... <laughs> Did I miss something? Yes. David Koontz is coming. Uh, no, it's just it's we're 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 closing in on ten o'clock, so the church has closed its parking lot, and uh, <laughs> it's just about time for everyone to go home. <laughs> yeah. Time to move uh, your car. Yeah, it's almost midnight in Minnesota. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I I have seen uh, some stereos of a number of uh, the later reunions on there. Uh, for that, I don't know uh, specifically uh, of ones uh, from the seventy fifth or uh, from the 50th, uh, uh, Bob was talking about that the, the uh, cards were popular for a number of years after the war. Uh, when the 50th rolled around and the 25th rolled around and the 50th rolled around, they did reissue the cards. They reissued the cards in the 1890s. They reissued the cards again uh, in uh, the in, at the 50th anniversary. In fact, they came out with a couple of other books uh, specifically regarding uh, photography uh, at the time of the 50th on there for that. So the, the original stereo cards have come out on a couple of occasions and a couple of times on there that uh, they did actually take stereos of uh, some of the groups. So uh, I've got some of those uh, from uh, some of those later groups on there. Uh, you can find them in various collections for those. Uh, obviously there weren't as much of an interest in those uh, particular stereo cards, uh, but uh, there are a few of them, uh, ma mainly from the late uh, 19th century uh, maybe going up to about the time of the 50th. I don't, I'm not aware of any from uh, the 75th, but uh, I mean, they, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if uh, some of them did exist uh, from that time frame then. Interesting. Yeah. I would love to see anything like that. I remember one of the, one of my favorite old stereo cards I have is of an old soldier's home, I believe in Indiana. And it's just a row of tables, you know, disappearing to infinity. And you can clearly see the thousand yard stairs on these guys' faces and what they must have seen in battle decades before is just, you know, just it's like a time machine ticket. It leaps right out at you. 
you know, uh, I'm I'm approaching. I'll I'll be sixty years old next year, and and that um, I, I remember when when I was a kid, and you would you would see these images of of people that were my age or you know in their 70s and 80s and they always showed them as, as somebody that was incredibly hard of hearing couldn't you know couldn't hear anything and that you know it's like now that you know that i've reached this particular age i realized that it was like hey you know it's like my my hearing is fine and you know i talk to people that are 10 15 years older than me they're fine uh they were actually just damaged by yeah. Uh, you know, you're talking about PTSD and those type of things. They, they didn't have that term, but you know, it's like their hearing was shot from uh, having no hearing protection, uh, and that that thousand yard stare that you're talking about, uh, the, you know, they're they're remembering uh, what it was, uh, you know, from uh, when they were uh, 17, 18 years old uh, in there, and that's that's what they're uh, that's what they're looking at, and that's what they're yeah. thinking about in those images. And yet an extraordinarily large number of those guys lived well into their 90s. I think like a disproportionate amount of Civil War foot soldiers lived to a very old age, which was interesting. You know, you, you talk about the age that it was like, oh, the people live longer today than they did then. Uh, I've actually gone and looked this up and uh, there's uh, pages on Wikipedia that will talk about this. You look up the age uh, for the last surviving soldier uh, for uh, different, uh, uh, different battles. Uh, so uh, think about it. The last surviving soldier for World War I died about 10 years ago uh, mm. in there, and he was 110 years old. Uh, and then you go back and look at the oh. ones from uh, the Spanish-American War, uh, from the, uh, the War uh, of uh, the Indians uh, War uh, in the 1880s, uh, the Civil War, uh, the War of 1812, and uh, the uh, Revolutionary War. And if you go all the way back to the Revolutionary War, how old do you think that last guy was when he died compared to the one that just died that was, he was 110 uh, for the First World War. How old do you think the last guy was for the Revolutionary War and the difference on how much further that we've aged, you know, it's like, oh, we're living longer these days. Huh. How old do you think that Revolutionary War guy was when he died, the last one? Think of all the women who outlived all those men. Uh, yep, I absolutely <laughs> agree. No kidding. But can anybody got a guess though? How old was the last Revolutionary War soldier when he died? How old was he? Probably 110. 109, 110. Every single one of those. Every single one is 109 or 110. Wow. Last one from Revolutionary War was 110. He wow. actually outlived the Civil War. So you're talking wow. about that. Wow. Oh, these guys lived all the way up to the Second World War. At the time when these guys were fighting during the Civil War, there were still soldiers alive that had fought in the Revolutionary War. And that's, you know, you think about that now. How many of you have met or talking or spoken or related to or know somebody that was – uh, a veteran of the Second World War, those individuals were alive and fighting at the time when a Civil War soldier was fighting and the Civil War soldiers were fighting at the time when a Revolutionary War fight. You know, just a, a handful of generations between uh, all of those. It's just really, wow. uh, you know, yeah. there's not much, yeah. not much well, separating those. For, Did you know in the Re Revolutionary for, for what War it's that, worth, that, that there was a black regiment, a, an African-American regiment? And were they recruited by the British, though? The British hired them. The no, British... Uh, no, so the they were around and tried to recruit the slaves in the south. But they did. Yeah, they did recruit because the slaves. They would be it's free just that... if they if if the British won. Right. In but, the Revolutionary uh, War. Wow, I didn't yep. know. Revolution. Yes, but the thing is, if they lived through it, just like even even the the black African Americans who lived through World War One or World War Two, didn't come back to much better. Right. Yeah. Uh, and when they came back. And they came back and they're wearing their, their uh, uniforms. They weren't well received because they were wearing their uniforms. Yeah. And sometimes in the South. In the South. In the South. Well, even in the North, there was still a lot of, I mean. That's interesting. And in, uh, here in Florida, the only major Civil War battle to be fought in Florida was called the Battle of Alusty. And it was fought up in the Pine Woods in North Florida. And um, one of the units that participated in it was the 54th Massachusetts, you know, from the movie Glory. And uh, the Union barely won that battle. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, actually, they lost it because they were going to take take over Tallahassee. They were marching east, I'm sorry, west from Jacksonville, from the port to Tallahassee, and Tallahassee, coincidentally, was the only Southern state capital that never fell during the whole war. So the Southerners managed to defend their state capital. The Union lost that battle, and they made the 54th 
pushed the trains 25 miles back to Jacksonville, treated them like cattle. You know, here these guys just went through a major battle and they still had to push the trains back by hand. It's crazy. Oh, God. It's crazy. Good night, Syracuse. Uh, and just, just an interesting note about, about the longevity of generations. Um, yeah. President John Tyler was born in 1790 and became uh, the president of the United States in 1841. And his grandson, as of 2018, was still alive. Whoa. Two of his, two of his grandsons. Wow. Yeah, two wow. of his grandsons were still alive. <laughs> yeah, th that's a really, really so, weird situation. So because you've, 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 yeah, you've got a family where three generations of the family actually cover almost the entire history of the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, the, oh. He had, he had a, 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 he started a family when he was like in his 80s, and then his son did the same thing, uh, which is why we end up with uh, just that uh, quite a bit of span. Uh, the next closest one where the grandson, the next grandson after him goes from like 1840 to like 1890 or something like that. There's like a 40 or 50 year span uh, mm -hmm. for the next oldest uh, living grandson uh, from, uh, uh, you know, from a president in there. So do they think politics were getting better? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> well, on, on that note, uh, on it that is, note. it is now after 10 o'clock. So we should probably let everyone go. Um, uh, it's Steve, midnight are you still in here? Minnesota. It's time yeah. to go to sleep. How yeah, many people? That's right. Uh, I like some of these backgrounds, you, like James you any... Long, your background is nice. And I already talked about Jim McManus and um, David Heiser, yeah. I like your background, the green leaves, very cool. Do you recognize mine, Valerie? Yep, are, are you you're, the you're at the armory. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jody, get your, car, get your car out of the parking lot. I never park in the parking lot, I always oh, park yeah. on the street. Jim, <laughs> what, what is your background, Jim? I take Jim? the train. Oh, Jim, no, what is what is Jim's background? Uh, it's Escher. Escher. It, about, I guess, at the oh, beginning no. of this COVID oh. crisis, uh, Disney made some backgrounds available just from some Star Wars shots. And I just took one of the, it's probably some hallway from a Star Destroyer or something. Um, I put in the comments, you know, it's the brig. If they know what to do with me, they better put me in the detention block. Uh, uh -huh. But uh, yeah, it was just a very simple conversion, uh, just with a depth map. And I didn't spend much time on it at all, but it looks pretty good. If I get out of the way, you can see it. I even put in a little detail in the floor so that you have a little, uh, the reflection goes down past the surface of the floor. Because as we all know, mm -hmm. reflections give away a bad conversion. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Neato. Yeah. So, so Steve, did you, did you have anything you wanted to say to close out the meeting? Yeah, I think uh, thanks everybody for filling in and uh, doing everything. I thought uh, the presentation was good. And uh, thanks a lot, uh, David Richardson, Absolutely. for getting him so quickly. Absolutely, glad to help. And he sounded like he's you know, willing to come back. So yeah. know, if we, uh, if we need somebody. I come back again, you know, he's ready. All right. Well, okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank Great. you, guys. Thanks. This was awesome. Thank you so much. We'll see you again. We'll see you again, hopefully, at uh, Virtual 3D Con. And then the following week, the LA 3D Club will have our online 65th birthday party. Thanks for all coming. Right. Excellent. Good to see all you guys. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 I'd like to get the book back. Are you done <laughs> which, with the book? Which book? The uh, naming digital, convention book? The Digital Asset Management? Yes. Yes. Have you read it yet? I haven't, but I can give it back. No, wait. I'll give it. Take another <laughs> month. Take, okay. read it, read it. We're signing off here. Okay. <laughs> Good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>